You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, who I am very excited to talk to, a retired two-star general who... Uh, Led just a distinguished career, and unfortunately, and I stress unfortunately, got more notoriety for his career at the very end of it than he ever did during it, at least in the public eye. We'll get to that coming up in just a moment. First, uh, a few announcements. As always, please follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. Tell your friends to do the same as well and help grow that social media following. Please don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. You go to our website, hazardground.com. You can click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab. Uh, and you can do all your normal Amazon shopping. It'll redirect you right to Amazon, do your, all of your normal Amazon shopping. We will get a percentage of what you guys spend. We donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations that have been featured here on the show. Our way of giving back and your way to help give back right from the comforts of your own house just by doing your everyday Amazon shopping. But you have to go to hazardground.com first. Please continue to leave us Apple reviews, five-star rating reviews. Help grow the show that way. Uh, we love hearing the comments. We love seeing them on, uh, on, in the Apple reviews and love posting them on social media for you guys. We certainly appreciate all the love and support. But uh, help that algorithm thing that computers and AI and everything else does nowadays and leave a five-star review. Give us a thumbs up and tell us why you love the show. Subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Leave some comments there. We certainly appreciate all of it. All right, this week's guest uh, is a retired Major General in the U.S. Army. Spent more than 33 and a half years in uniform. Last commanding uh, the U.S. Army Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning. Uh, Spent time throughout several different stations in his career, including in the 4th Infantry Division, where he was the battalion commander of the famed 167 Cav Regiment uh, within the 4th Infantry Division, uh, also commanded a, at, at Fort Drum as part of the 10th Mountain Division, uh, held several different posts throughout his career, the Pride of New Jersey and the Pride of the Villanova Wildcats. Joining us on the show, Major General Retired Pat Donahoe here on the Hazard Ground. Sir, welcome and thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's uh, look again. It is it is uh, unfortunate that uh, when people hear your name now, it's associated with with something that really had nothing to do with your career, other than you just living up to the army values and and doing what you thought was right. Uh, we'll get to the whole Twitter thing at the end. And full disclosure, and I'll tell everybody this: if anybody's you know guys, all that stuff is open source information out there. Google his name; you'll get all the stories you need on it. It's not going to be the focus of this show. Certainly, we're going to talk about it, but that's not why I want a Major General Dono here. There's a long, distinguished career, including, by the way. Um, one of the most noted battles during the Iraq war against the Mahdi army in July of 2006 that we will dive into. Uh, and by my accounts, uh, and, and with the help of you, sir, doing some reading, that might have been one of the more perfectly executed military operations I've ever read about. I mean, honestly, like, I, I don't know how many things that could have gone... If Murphy's Law ever decided to check out, it was on that day, it feels like. Because of, of all the things that could have gone wrong, almost nothing did. Uh, and and it, it just speaks a lot to, I think, I, I don't like to say luck gets involved in anything when it, when it comes to combat, certainly randomness, but when it comes to executing what you guys did, it was, it was done with near flaw, flaw you know, near perf- perfection and flawlessness, and I'm excited to talk about it. So uh, we will go back to your days as a, as a CAV commander coming up, but uh, we always like yeah. to start at the beginning, sir. But, by the way, the whole <laughs> host of stuff went wrong that day. <laughs> whole host of stuff, and, and we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, yeah, and, and and by the way, it's it's one six seven armor. It's a combined armors battalion. So it's uh, what did I say? One six seven cav. Cav. Yeah. So it's cav oh my bad. I'm sorry. With a B at the end. Uh, back. But it's but it's you know it's it's lineage is the first battalion is six seventh armor. But um, yeah, so it's a combined armors battalion. All right. Well, again, uh, once again, I am in the wrong. But let's start back <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, and as to how and why you got in the military. Uh, you know, I mean, and and where it all started for you. Yeah, so it, I, I growing up like every other young boy probably in America in the you know sixty late sixties you know I was born in sixty seven and then growing up through the seventies you know I, you know I used to dig little trench lines and you know in our front yard and I had little plastic army men going back and forth and uh, but I was just enamored with kind of military history and and you know studying the Second World War and you know. You know, I can remember I, w- I was like the only kid pulling out all of the war books out of the library at the elementary school that I, I went to. 
And my mother was convinced that I was somehow reincarnated from a guy off the Arizona because I was I was fascinated with the story of Pearl Harbor and 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 specifically the battleship uh, USS Arizona. And so it just was a natural flow into uh, you know, in high school applying for ROTC scholarships for both uh, the Army and the Navy. And eventually the choice came down to do I go with an Army scholarship or Navy scholarship based on where I got accepted. And I, I didn't get accepted to Georgetown, which is started a lifelong hatred of that school. And I went to I went to Villanova, and uh, yeah, that was back in the day. The, you know, Georgetown used to actually have a good basketball team. Uh, yeah, well, that was where but, I was going yeah. next. I was going to say you, <laughs> at Villanova. Now you finally got the upper hand. Georgetown can't seem to win a damn conference game to save their skin, uh, and, and yeah. Villanova's got some national titles in their back pocket. Yeah, it's 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 kind of terrible to see what's happened to that program based on you know. I mean, you know, if Georgetown's playing anybody from outside the Big East Conference, I'm rooting for them. But, you know, inside the conference, uh, you know, I'm rooting against them. But the, uh, but yeah, I ended up, I ended up going to Villanova. And so I ended up starting my time in uniform as a Navy midshipman at Villanova in 1985. And, and so I, I really was enjoying the, the experience in the Navy program, but, it, you know, it really, a whole lot of math and science goes with that. And like every high school or every college freshman, I made a whole series of choices early on in my college career. To My first semester, I was an accounting major in the Navy program, hated the accounting program, transferred over to really, which was my kind of just passion, which was history, transferred over to the School of Arts and Sciences with a history major in my second semester freshman year. And I can remember calling my dad from the payphone in the bottom of Solid Hall at Villanova, you know, this cinder block, you know, kind of prison cell, kind of college dormitory of the, you know, the 80s and uh, calling my dad and going, hey, hey, I'm really not enjoying the Navy program. It's, you know, it's just, it's just onerous. And he was like, yeah, okay, hey, I got it. I'm thinking about going over to the Army program. He was just like, he had been a second lieutenant in Korea in uh, 1954 or 56 in the artillery. And he just went, Pat, the Navy has entire ships. All they do is make ice cream. You want to be in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but that was his perspective of, you know, kind of, you know, the, the, you know, being in the Navy compared to being in the army. And I was like, yeah, okay. I just, I just, just hated the program. And so on, on Ash Wednesday of my freshman year in college, I went, uh, I went in and, and I signed out of the Navy program. And if, if you're a good Roman Catholic, you you understand that I gave up the Navy for Lent. <laughs> well done, <laughs> well done. It's interesting because um, you know I uh, I am also a graduate of a uh, Catholic Jesuit institution. In fact, the three schools I applied to uh, were Loyola, Villanova, and Fairfield. Yeah, uh, and the, the the only one I didn't I got I actually set my side note I set my deposit in to go to Villanova. Like I actually didn't get I ended up at Loyola in Maryland. Didn't actually get in there. I got waitlisted. I got into every other school I applied to because apparently at the time they had like so many applicants that year. Anyway, I got waitlisted and I, and I was already locked into ROTC at Villanova and I had set my deposit in and uh, literally like a week after I set my deposit in, I got one of those financial aid packages back in the day that they used to hand out that kind of just like wowed my mom. I was like, yo, we need to change now. You need to go to Loyola because this is going to save you a ton of money down the road. And so I ended up at, but I was literally had one foot in the door uh, in Pennsylvania, in Villanova, to go to school there. Yeah, no, I tell you, I, I loved the experience in Villanova, and, and and again, I you know I really had my heart set as a as a high school senior on going to Georgetown, you know, going to school in DC, and you know the Georgetown name at that point, and uh, oh, yeah. it, it turned out for you know they always kind of they always kind of say hey you know you know unanswered <laughs> unanswered prayers usually work out the best. And, uh, and, and really did. I mean, my experience at Villanova was fantastic. It was, it was obviously the right environment for me. And then, and then making that choice to change over from the Navy program and the Army program was the, the absolute right choice. And I knew that better 20 years later when I was doing my, my joint experience uh, with the Navy. And, and I a very, very different approach to leadership in the Navy, very, very different approach to just kind of human, human interaction in the Navy compared to the Army. And I, yeah, I, I would not have done well in the Navy and in, in the in their culture, and uh, and so I, I 
series of decisions got made for me early in my life, which put me on a, on a path that was better suited to, to, you know, my, you know, my outlook. Right. It's interesting because I, I want to ask you a couple of big picture questions as we go along. And again, obviously, folks, you know this. Whenever we have somebody who's been on, been in the military for over 33 years, it's hard to encapsulate every assignment, everything that we do together. But just because of your varying perspectives on everything and, and your entire career, you know, you talk about uh, the culture and, and where it is. And, and I, I agree wholeheartedly. Like, you know, again, I did Army ROTC. I didn't have a choice. But, you know, I, I throughout my career in, in, in certain assignments, and I talk about this on the show repeatedly, you know, I, I fit a lot better in the special ops community because of the sort of, hey, you know, do the job and everything else falls into place. The, the, the lack of, you know, babysitting, the, 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 the amount of autonomy that you get and the freedom that you get to sort of, you know, work in an environment with a bunch of professionals who aren't going to sit there and stand over your shoulder. Some, some of the things you don't necessarily get in the, in the regular army, uh, I always fit in better there. What, when you talk about the culture, at that time, the culture of the military was so much different than it is now. Like do, when you look back on the culture that you joined in, do you see the, the wide array of differences that you sort of started with and then ended with? Yeah, I think, you know, I think this, this whole discussion of looking back 30 years and, and, you know, kind of think old man on the lawn yelling at the cloud. Right. Um, I, when you when you talk to young men and women coming in the army today, the vast majority of them are coming in the army for the same reasons we came in, right? They're they're right. looking for something bigger than themselves. They're looking to be part of a great team. They're 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 looking to be personally challenged, and and that that culture is still driven to satisfy those needs, even in the conventional army. And 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 it's it's really an interesting because I've. You know, I've touched the special operations community a couple of times, never was part of it, but was able to kind of look into it from, from next door. And there are significant challenges when you take a special ops person out of that community and bring them over to the conventional side. Yep. And similar when you bring a conventional guy and you put him into, you put him into the special ops community because they're, they're very, very different things. And so you know, when I was a brigade commander, I was a, it was actually a training support brigade commander in First Army. And the brigade had the responsibility to train all the provincial reconstruction teams going into Afghanistan from 2010 to 12. Yeah, that's right. 2010 to 12. And, and so, you know, a, a provincial reconstruction team at that time was commanded by either an Air Force or a Navy 05. And two of the, I think the 13 teams we'd train it every, you know, every five months or so we would train those guys. Uh, two of the 13 were commanded by Navy SEALs and the SEAL teams were different in that their senior enlisted was not an army sergeant major. It was a, it was a Navy chief. It was an E8 in the Navy was, uh, who was a SEAL working for the SEAL commander. And, uh, and it, you'd have to constantly go back and grab the E8 and kind of go, look, man, this, your, your whole big boy rules thing does not work here. It does not work when you've got a staff of army, active army and army reserve and Navy folks working on the staff. And then you've got an army reserve uh, CA, A team and B team, right? Civil affairs teams out of the army reserve. And then you've got a national guard rifle platoon that's attached. And you've got to build a unit out of that. You can't look at an 18-year-old private in a rifle platoon and, and trust them to do the absolute right thing at all the right times because they haven't been trained to do it. The reason you can do that in the special operations community is you that individual has been trained to a level that is incomparable to any other soldier or you know Navy sailor out there. And so the differences in leadership are are, are, are really significant and 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 you, if you bring big boy rules to organizations that aren't trained to operate like that, disaster, right? And if you yeah. if you bring rifle platoon rules to a, to a SEAL team, disaster, right? So if you got to understand the cultures, the strengths and weaknesses of both, and then and then try to maximize the the effect in the organization that you've got to lead. Proverbial square peg in the uh, old round holes. So uh, yeah, doesn't hey, seem and, to work but, out well. But Nick, you actually kind of say, hey, you look at the culture over 34 years or so, right? You know, we've got this whole 
this whole discussion right now about you know the military, and of course it's a political narrative, right? The military now is weak and we're woke and all these all these things, and and that's first off, it's not true, right? Second off, it, it's exactly what we've always done. It, it's go back, watch any World War II movie. Who's in the platoon? You know, if you're in a John Wayne movie, you know, Sansa Iwo Jima, who's in the platoon? There's a Hispanic kid, there's a Jewish kid, there's a kid from the Bronx, there's there's the farm boy from the Midwest, there's the, you know, the southern, you know, the southern kid. I mean, it's it's America's in that platoon. And and the charge of the leadership is to build a team out of that, out of that, you know, that melting pot of Americans who are in that organization. It is the same thing we do today. And just and and the same, you know, jocularity, kidding. All that stuff still occurs inside these small units, right? But when it gets out of hand, just like back in the old days, you, you, had, a, you had to come to Jesus, right? There was a fight at some point, and then you, know, you stood up for who you were and what you believed in, et cetera. Those things still happen, right? But the, the challenge is we've, we, as a culture, we have always, as a people, after, after a lot of friction, value the inputs of all folks who are willing to come out. And then in, sure. in an all volunteer military, we're, we're looking for everybody who can serve to be able to serve. And then we've got to, we gotta, first off, just like that, just like the old lady in the airport, we got to thank them for their service. Right? Hey, thanks for choosing to serve in in our military today and serve the nation because the nation really needs it. And our adversaries, they out they out, outnumber us five to one when you look at the Chinese and the Russians. Yeah, you know, we can't we can't just say hey we're only going to have kids from New Jersey. That's it. That's the only folks who can serve, right? We can't, we can't establish. They have good hair. They have good hair. <laughs> there you go. They have real good hair. A lot of gel. Right. A lot of moose. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be no more, no more Taylor ham or pork roll in the world. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, but we gotta, we, we gotta, we gotta make sure that we've got pathways for folks, folks to serve. And then, and then we, we as leaders have got to build cohesive teams out. It's same thing, same problem 34 years ago. Matter of fact, yeah, my first, and platoon, that'll never change. My first platoon was even more diverse. Because I had that, I had that Sansa Yujima platoon, and then I had a Katusa on every tank. So you had to build, you had to build cohesive teams out of Americans, and the Korean augmentee of the United States Army. Because if you were, if you're going to go combat those, those guys, they were the loader on every tank. I, I tell that story often on my first platoon that I had uh, on active duty, and you know I'm a New York kid, an Italian kid with a with a, with a wise ass mouth uh, who had an answer for everything, um, which you know got me in some hot water at times, but when talking to my platoon, you know, I meet these kids from Kentucky and West Texas and everything else. And I'm like, this is foreign to me. I'm sitting in the middle of Fort hood talking about life experiences that I didn't even know existed because New Jersey was the West to me growing up. Like that was, you know, as far West as I was willing to go. You know, if I crossed a river over a bridge or it it was like a, you know, a a monumental thing in my life. So, uh, you know, it, 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 that experience, I think, um, you know, is, it molds a lot of us at the very beginning. Um, and, and it's different from the officer to the enlisted side because, you know, there's a certain amount of, of uh, when you put all the, you know, young lieutenants and officers and they go through training in ROTC, there's a certain amount of, uh, I, for lack of a better term, I, I just want to say, it's not like eliteness, but it's just like you're operating at a different level, right? And then you put yourself in, 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 in a squad or, 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 you know, down at a team level and you start talking to the guys down there and you realize the dynamic is completely different than what you had in ROTC and what you were working towards. You're just, you're talking to regular Joes. And, and uh, from the very beginning, I always had empathy for Joe. Uh, I always had empathy for the guys in the squad. I, I never, you know, I always held on to that maxim that I never would ask them to do something I wouldn't do myself. Period, and and I, I always believed in that, and I, I still do to this day. Yeah. So Nick, I'm gonna I'm gonna go up to Cornell tomorrow morning, and I'm gonna talk to yeah. Cornell University's joint ROTC programs. And so I'm gonna, you know, when I talk to those guys, I'm gonna think, hey, look, nobody in your platoon knows what Cornell is, right? They they don't yeah. know, and and more importantly, they don't care. You know, you're their platoon leader. They're happy you're not a West Pointer, but you're their platoon leader, right? And now. What are you, how are you going to serve them? How are you going to serve with them? How are you going to build that team, be part of that team? Because you know, that's a very, very mm-hmm. different type of leadership. And so, you know, it's, um, you know, the, that's always the challenge of the new lieutenant, right? You walk in, you're quote unquote in charge. You know the least about the organization than anybody there. 
And now you've got to, you've got to make your way into that organization so you can help bring them forward as a team and you can help, um, you know, be in the right position to make the right decisions at the right time for that group of individuals. And I can remember, you know, one, one stallion night of my, you know, the, you know, my first two years in uniform, it was team spirit, 1990. And I've got a platoon of M60 A3 uh, tanks. And I've literally, I've been the platoon leader, I think a month and a half at that point. And we're in some river valley down outside of, outside of Wanju, I guess it was. And, and we're in this rice paddy and I hop off the tank and I hop into a, into a rice paddy. And I've got my big giant custom-made Korean tanker boots on that like, literally come up to my knees. And I walk and I and I I get up on all you know the other three tanks in the platoon. And I'm and I'm just kind of talking to you know the members of the platoon who I don't really know all that very well yet. And it was just kind of, you know, because we were gonna be there for like two days in this defensive position. And you know, you're improving your position and doing all those things, but you're you're also you got a lot of downtime and it was just an opportunity for me to just kind of learn about everybody in the platoon. And you do, you walk away from that experience with just this really humbling experience of, wow, these, you know, some of these guys have done incredible things in their lives already, or have had, you know, horrendous lives and came into the army for, you know, Hey, I had to escape X, Y, and Z. And, and just that the ability that every junior officer really has to either have or develop is to be empathetic and to try to go okay, understand why your soldiers are doing what they're doing and why they're in the army to begin with. And then how, how can you make them better? How can you connect them better to the team? Right. And then I walk all the way back to my tank and then I hop up on my tank and I hop in the turret and Sergeant E5, Charles Kennedy turns around and just starts screaming at me, get the fuck out of the tank. And I'm like, what, <laughs> what? He's like, get out of the tank. I'm like, the hell's going on so you know, i push myself back up out of the tc statue goes jesus christ lt your, your boots are covered in shit and it was it was i was in a rice paddy in the spring that had been freshly manured with human fecal oh. right? and <laughs> and so God. so for the i have i have pictures i'd have to find them but i've got pictures the, the M60 tank had big eyelets on the front of the turret so, to help, uh, you know, for the cranes to be able to lift the thing. And I've got that pair of tanker boots strapped to the eyelets for like the rest of that team spirit. And, uh, and I remember Chuck Kennedy, because he was this guy, he was like a 32 year old E5, had, you know, had, had been an E6 <laughs> once or twice before. I mean, he's he, the stereotypical guy, right? And then, uh, and he was, he was a good tanker, right? So he was fat and, uh, but man, the guy could shoot, right? And then I had a very similar experience as a battalion commander, right? I had this, you know, this, just this kind of barrel chested, you know, you know, plug of a guy who was my, my gunner as a battalion commander who kept me alive in Iraq. He was just, same thing, it was not, it was not this, yeah. you know, picture perfect American soldier looks like Skeletor, but man, that, that guy could shoot a perfect tank run, right? And, uh, we ended up putting him out of the army as a staff sergeant because he couldn't make weight. And you look back and now I, I was gone. I was at a battalion command by that point, but, but you just kind of look at that and you go, man, well, I mean, I understand, I understand all of our standards. Sometimes they work against us. I remember as a troop commander in Germany, putting two mechanics out of the army who couldn't make weight while well, they were in Germany and they were probably drinking three or four loaves of bread a night, you know, of, you know, half of ice. And so their ability to make weight was, was hard because uh, they were mechanics and they were Americans and they were drinking beer in Germany. And we probably, the PT program for the mechanics probably wasn't what it should have been because they were in the motor pool, <laughs> turning wrenches, get our whole yep. rate up, you know, and all those kind of things. And we put those guys out of the arm. And so, so again, I, you know, I go back and I look at that, those discussions, like, man, if I had, if I had been more empathetic to some of my guys, how could we have helped them negotiate some of that? And then some of the decisions that get made along the way, you know, it'd be a, you know, how do you, how do you use the powers you've got to, to build teams at, at every echelon, whether that's a platoon leader or as a mm -hmm. battalion commander or brigade commander. So kind of going back, uh, you know, you end up commissioning in 89. Now, you know, Gulf War kicks off within two years there. Um, you know, 
I'll ask this question twofold. One, I assume you missed it, but two, like, you know, for the guy who watched all the movies and dug all the trenches and everything else growing up as a kid, you know, I know we all have in the back of our mind that combat can, you know, be part of the reality, but, you know, for somebody like me, like Mark went into the service in the Clinton administration where we never thought we were going to going to get in a war, right? Um, but, you know, I mean, it was always a reality. Did you think at some point in time that combat was in your very near future when you signed up? Or when you commissioned, I should say. So it's it's actually interesting. I one of the cadet I'm dealing with up at Cornell asked me this exact question and kind of wants me to talk about it with the the cadets because there's this there's this belief that you really do know your future, right? And you know kind of what your what the next 10, 15, 20 years entail for you. And and in the you know my experience is that. It's, it, you absolutely have no idea what the next couple of years, 10 years, 20 years entail. And so, you know, I'm in college, 1985, 1989. I mean, I'm taking Russian because I'm going to be an armor platoon leader coming out of college. And I'm going to be on the inner German border. And we're going to be facing down the Soviets, you know, six guards army. You know, I'm either going to be in the Tan pocket uh, across from Czechoslovakia, or I'm going to be on, on the fold of gap across the IGB from, from East Germany. Hey, two years after I graduate from college, those countries don't even exist. They're gone. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. Czech, Czechoslovakia is now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. You know, East Germany is now merged back into the Federal Republic of Germany. The Soviet Union has transitioned. And you're like, wow, okay. That's... That's this huge change. And then you go to, you know, when I'm a second lieutenant in Korea, I can remember, I can remember the reports of you know, Saddam Hussein you know, invading and seizing Kuwait and, and all of the you know, angst that was occurring in, you know, in Korea and the army as, they were, as we were sending folks off the Desert Storm. And I can remember going into my battalion commander and saying, hey, sir, I want to, I know I, I had already extended in Korea at that point before the invasion occurred. And I went in and I said, hey, I, I wanna I wanna take my extension back and I wanna and I wanna go, right? I wanna go to the fight. Because you know, everybody's oh we're gonna lose. you're gonna miss the great patriotic war, right? And and I can remember him finally coming to me one night. We were out, we were out on a gunnery range out at Rodriguez Range, because we were up doing kind of um, you know kind of shows of force kind of stuff for the North Koreans to hear a shooting gunnery and that kind of thing. We had transitioned at that point to M1IPs, and I was the support platoon leader for the battalion. And my battalion commander, Pat Blazik, uh, found me and said, hey, I've recommended to the, you know, the division chief of staff or something that you and a couple other guys be allowed to be allowed now to leave and go to Saudi Arabia and be in the kind of the replacement pool. And, and I can remember that night being like, oh, my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be the dog that caught the car. I mean, you know. Is this really what you want to do? And I can remember, you know, just kind of really being uh, pensive, you know, through that through that night, next couple of days, uh, until finally I came back and said, ah, nobody's leaving. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I was brave enough to ask to go, right? Right. And, and so, you know, one of the things I always talk to young, you know, leaders about is you've, you're going to be given a certain amount of time to prepare you don't know how long that preparation is. Is it, you know, because a bunch of my friends went right into combat. You know, we graduated in the summer of 89 and they were fighting by the end of 1990, 91, uh, you know, against, against the Iraqis. And so they were given, you know, six months or so with their platoons to be ready to go fight. And, and so you got to kind of, whatever time you've got, you've got to use to prepare. The same thing, I, they, I then, you know, I, I went to Bosnia as a captain uh, I was on the staff of one one cav, and then I went into command of of one six seven armor in the summer of in the summer of two thousand five, and I knew at that point that I was going to take them to Iraq. Right. But I had I had never been I had never been in combat, and at that point I was now thirty eight years old going into combat, and so yeah. you know the, you know the Lord similar the Lord same, obviously except ten years younger <laughs> knew I needed more time to prepare, right? So I mean, I mean, look, I. I to that similar thing, like I said, I, you know, I, I joke around. It's like, you know, uh, that 
when I was in college, you know, uh, and I was finishing up ROTC, and career fairs were coming on, and all my fellow classmates had asked me to go to the career fair, and I'm like, no, and they're like, why? And I'm like, because I have to go into the Army after college. And they looked me dead in the eye and said, why don't you get a real job? Right. I mean, this was pre 9-11 because that's what everybody thought. Like everybody, you know, at that point in time, you, you went into the military because you kind of were out of options and you didn't really know what to do. Right. I mean, Clinton had downsized the active force to pre-World War II levels uh, and, and we were we were fat and happy. And of course, the, the world changed. And, you know, similarly, I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I had, was a mid-grade captain and I was getting deployed for the first time in 2005. And I had no idea what I was walking into. None. Um, and, and I. I always ask the question because I know what my emotions were. I, 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 there was a, I remember talking to my company and a couple of platoons and, and explaining to them that, look, I can't, you know, I can't hundred percent justify why, what we're going, where we're going, what we're going to do. But, you know, I remember holding up the, the time magazine of the twin towers exploding. And I just said to them, you know, this hits home for me cause I'm a New Yorker, but all I know is, is that this happened and there's still a country left to defend, and that's what we're going to go do. And I left it at that. Um, and and I, I didn't try to complicate it any more than that. But I was, I was definitely scared. Like, I, I w- was going into combat not knowing what to expect. And I, I had no idea what I was going into. I had no idea I was going to walk into, you know, this, this uh, you know, special forces operation where I got to do things I was probably never trained for. Uh, probably didn't even have any, any of the background to do. I mean, I'm a, I'm a log guy by trade, right? But next thing you know, I'm <laughs> sitting there running, you know, combat convoys, building a, a, an Iraqi support battalion, teaching them basic infantry tactics at a 7-8, you know, and just making it all work on the fly. And in the meantime, you know, I'm getting shot at and blown up on a routine basis. And infantry guys and infantry officers are sitting there guarding gates and guarding prisons going, when can I get in the fight? So it was, it was a complete role reversal, but it's just one of those things, I think, you know, to your point, sir, it's like, you just don't overthink the lack of preparedness. Just do what you know how to do, and, and sometimes things fall into place. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, again, when when the nation goes to combat, you know, the folks who go, they think they're going to do one thing. They're going to be asked to do a whole bunch of other things, right? Yeah. And, and that, that doesn't that doesn't change if it's counterinsurgency campaign in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, or if it's you know high end combat against the North Koreans in in Korea. I mean, look at the story of Colonel Ralph Puckett when he's a lieutenant, you know, ends up ends up a recipient of the Medal of Honor. He puts together the Ranger Company for Eighth Army, and it's all clerks and jerks that he puts together that Ranger Company. And then he trains them, you know, through this pretty arduous training program that he basically comes up with as their company commander, and then leads them into combat throughout uh, throughout the campaign, you know, early on in the Korean War. And so it it is. And you see that time and time again throughout throughout history of you're going to be asked to do things that you've not been trained for, but you've been given enough training to be able to then riff from that and get after what the new mission is that you've just been given. I want to get to your time in, in 167 Armor, but you know, I just was curious. I know it's, again, it's a long time we're talking about from commissioning to battalion command. But sort of seminal moments, you know, throughout your career. I mean, where were you on 9-11? What were you doing? I mean, you know, was, was there anything else that stands out to you prior to uh, that? Because, you know, you mentioned that's your first, you know, combat experiences with 167 Armor. So uh, what's sort of like this, the, the short-term gist of, of what you went through in, you know, 15 years? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so just, you know, I mean, first of all, the, the, the formative uh, in, you know, experience of being in Korea as a platoon leader where, you had this, you had, in 1989, 91, you had this incredible freedom in Korea to train. I can remember literally going down to the motor pool and just firing up all four tanks and driving out into the into the riverbed and practicing platoon maneuvers, right? Platoon actions on contact. You, you can't do that anywhere else in the world, right? right. But you, and, you, and you can't do it today in Korea, but you could do it <laughs> you know, in 1989 and 91 in Korea. And, and it, was, it was fantastic. And then, you know, I get pulled out, you know, again, going to, hey, something you're completely not trained to do. I get pulled out of tank platoon time at about the six month mark and get moved into the support platoon. I had no idea what the support platoon did. Right. And, and, and at that point, you know, the, the fact that fuel and ammo and f- food came up to us was, you know, that was just the super, superhuman powers of the first sergeant. I had no idea where that, 
came from from behind the company. And uh, and I can just remember just learning through all that of just like trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. And and, and you had this mixed bag of other officers, that, you know, trying to, you know, the S4 may or may not have known right. what he was doing, right? The XO who was, was a character in himself, right? And Blazik, the battalion commander, he was just wanted to fight the battalions. He wanted all that other stuff to just happen. And, and the guy who got me through that was was Donald Hill. He was my sergeant. He was the platoon sergeant, sergeant first class Don Hill, who was this stereotypical, you know, kind of post Vietnam era soldier. Actually, he may have been a Vietnam vet, and um, yeah, and I can remember him chain smoking right up till six thirty, throwing the last cigarette on the ground, forming up the platoon, and then taking us on a run at a pretty good clip. And, uh, Wasn't it crazy how those smokers still? They, we're not built like that anymore. Like right. I, used to, I was, I was in RTC with a dude who smoked up all day long. We'd go out and run like a six point, the six minute, you know, mile. Like, and I'm like, dude, how can I not catch you? Yeah. Like you're three steps from dying and you're still smoking me. We would have had no fear of him catching COVID because he would have killed everything in his body. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just. But but he was this fantastic trainer. I mean, he just took me under his wing, put, pointed me outside the platoon when he needed. You're like, hey, go go work with the staff and figure that out. And then, Hey, I got this 50 cal training we're doing with the platoon, but, but he, but he then would, you know, train me on all those, you know, aspects of, you know, the technical aspect of the profession. He was, and he was a former, he was a former tanker. He was a, it was like a 19 echo M60 platoon, uh, you know, M60 tanker got out and then came back in. And when he came back in, the army did what we always did. Oh, you want to come back in the army? only thing you can be is a truck driver. And so they brought him in as an 88 Mike to come back in, but he was, and, but he was fantastic for that. So, so that formative event was incredible. And then as a, as a, I went to Germany as a, as a company or as a uh, captain and I went to one, one cab and I got to one, one cab about a month after they had crossed the river into the, you know, across the Sava river into Bosnia. And so I went into Bosnia among the first group of replacements that were flown into Tuzla. And so I spent nine months in Bosnia as the, as the assistant operations officer for, for one, one calf. And that was, you know, back in the day, I mean, in mid nineties, we, we, Hey, that, that was combat, right? We were thinking, ah, oh, this is it. We're, we're in the, we're in the shy stuff. Right. And uh, you know, looking back from 10 years before that, you were like, yeah, that wasn't bad. Right. <laughs> and, um, but it was, you know, it came with all of the, all of the aspects of personal fear, uh, the requirement for planning, the requirement to make decisions, the requirement to, um, you know, be, be situationally aware. I mean, all those things that, that come with being in an environment where, where folks can get, can get, you know, badly hurt or, you know, worse. And uh, it was, it was, it was a great introduction to, you know, being on operations without, you know, thank God we didn't have a whole lot of people trying to, you know, we didn't have anybody trying to kill us at that point. Right. Cause they were, they were pretty petrified of all the firepower we had, but but th those and th those things, right? So, captain in Bosnia, uh, platoon leader, lieutenant in uh, in Korea, and then as a battalion S three, uh, I was the S three of the Intrinsic Action Task Force. And if you remember, between the between the two great uh, Iraq wars, we we rotated a eleven hundred man task force into Kuwait, and it was. We got to do that. We were the last intrinsic action task force because we were in Kuwait on 9-11. But, oh, wow. but that mission, that mission was fantastic because you were out in the desert. Like you, you were at the cabal. So when when we when we started bombing Afghanistan and we were bombing Kabul, we had a bunch of families in Fort Riley, Kansas, frantic over the fact that we were bombing Kabul and their husband was at the cabal, right? So it was just like <laughs> So it was, it was not just a little but, emphasis on the accent that can change everything. Right. Right. And so, uh, but I mean, that, that environment, you know, again, you know, this kind of freedom to be out. Um, and, you know, my battalion commander was a fantastic battalion commander, a guy named Bart Howard. And, uh, you know, he, we used to joke that he was the great leader. We should have big, you know, posters all over camp, you know, all over the, all over the Kabul, uh, the, uh, the cabal of him with, you know, like the great leader, the great leader is watching. Right. You know, and uh, but he was fantastic and he took advantage of the the opportunity that being a battalion task force detached from 
really any real higher authority at that point because Third Army Forward that was in Kuwait was not a very operationally intrusive headquarters, right? So you right. were out, you were out in the desert about five miles off the Iraqi border. And we did all sorts of great training. I mean, we were out in the desert all the time. We did a live fire uh, battalion, you know, task force live fire. That was fantastic. And the, the organization was unique. We had, uh, you know, Major General retired, Mike Milano was the brigade commander. And he, for the mission, he cut us the brigade reconnaissance troop. We had two tank companies out of 134 Armor. We had a mechanized infantry company. We had a mechanized engineer company out of the engineer battalion. We had a 109 battery out of 15 field artillery. And then we had attached a, a, uh, an MLRS battery out of some rocket battalion, I think out of Fort Sill. And uh, they were so nervous about how we were going to employ the rocket uh, rocket battery that they sent a major with them. And so he slept in the command tent with you know me, the the XO and and the battalion commander and this major from the S S three uh, from the from the rocket battalion. So we used to sing Elton John's Rocket Man to him all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but and then we had on call we had a we had a company of Apaches that were down in Doha, Kuwait. I mean that for a young major to kind of wrestle with all of that and then to go through the go through this surreal and event of 9-11 occurring while you're five miles off the Iraqi border. Yeah. Um, it was, it was incredible, right? The developmental, both, both intellectually and professionally of that assignment was, 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 was absolutely unparalleled. And, and, you know, we, we ended up, you know, seeing the transition of, you know, the army in Kuwait being kind of this kind of backwater, you know, we're able to rotate this task force in there every six months and it'll be, it'll do what it does to all of a sudden being at the forefront of the buildup that occurs before we actually go into Iraq uh, yeah. nearly, what, two years later, year and a half later. And so, I mean, that, that was, all of that was really developmental and formative. And you don't know at the time, but it was all building me up to to take 167 armor and take them into, in, into combat in, in, the, in the rotation before the surge. Right. And so- uh, and- I was going to say, sir, and for, and for the record, that uh, you're the only person I've ever heard describe Kuwait as a great assignment. Uh, <laughs> and I genuinely mean that because uh, n- nobody wanted to be in Kuwait. And especially, you know, once the war kicked off, it was not the place you wanted to be, right? Because um, you, were, you, were, you were close enough to be there, but for, far enough away that it was, you were not useful, um, right. which, which can be annoying. But I, I did want to transition to 167. Yeah, just right just say, what, I wouldn't wish ahead, on anyone a Kuwait tour post-2003. <laughs> But, no. two, but 2001, that was, that was pretty cool, right? Because of all this driving around the desert shooting stuff that you got to do, which was a lot of fun without anybody shooting back, right? But yeah, after the war kicked off, no, no self-respecting you know, gentleman or gentlewoman would want to be in Kuwait. Right. For the record. All right, let me set, let me set the stage on the record. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep that there. Uh, let me set the stage here for those who aren't familiar uh, with, with what had happened in July of 2006. Um, and, and I had departed... Um, Iraq uh, in April of 2006. So I had I had just uh, had just left for this, and and we've talked about the you know height of the violence in 05 into 06. Uh, roadside bombs were, were everywhere, IEDs and everything else. I mean, it was just it was pure chaos. It was Muqtada al Sadr and his his army, the Mahdi army, that was starting the sectarian violence on both sides. Uh, you know, there were Shiites and Sunnis going back and forth. Uh, and at that point in time, ba- Baghdad, at least, and many others, S- Sadr City was, you know, I mean, you want to talk about a pucker factor. It's like when, when, whenever we had to go over there, for me, it was complete like, oh, d- this is going to be a bad day uh, kind of deal. That with Fallujah and Ramadi out there and everything going on. But down in Musaib, where, where you guys were stationed, about 30 miles south southeast of Baghdad, um, not too far from there, uh, the Mahdi army had began to de- develop a stronghold um, in, in the areas and in the towns. And again, more of the secretary and violence was going on on both sides. Uh, and, and 167 Armor was was one of the units down there, basically just um, sent out there, for lack of a better term, just to put some control into the area, try to win over the populace, try to, try to you know, separate the good guys from the bad uh, and, and, you know, work your way through um, what was at the time very tense areas. It was very tense, you know, feelings from the populace and people and everything else. Um, and so 
when you guys get on ground, I'm not sure when that deployment started for you guys, but when you get on ground, like what is the general consensus of what your mission is heading into the deployment? Yeah, so so Mark, let me kind of provide a little bit more wraparound too, right? So the okay. so we were in second brigade, fourth ID, fourth infantry division itself had Baghdad. Mm-hmm. Right. So they had Baghdad and then they've got one of their brigades pretty far south of Baghdad. Uh, and the brigade AO included route Tampa. So the brigade's mission as the brigade saw it, and John Tully was the brigade commander, is a fantastic, fantastic guy. I, I don't know if he'd say the same thing, but I, I the brigade's main effort was to keep Tampa open, right? They're, they they had to secure the lifeline through their AO to, to Baghdad, which was the center of gravity. The interesting piece was that's General Casey, who was the commander for U.S. forces in Iraq, had just established the, uh, the counterinsurgency campaign as we're coming in, right? And so that, that was a real significant change as we were looking at the fight. First of all, the U.S. now started to admit we had an insurgency we were dealing with at the end of, yeah, that's what really kind of end of 2004, beginning of 2005, Really, no. I guess I guess later on, summer summer two thousand five, they begin to publicly acknowledge we've got a yep. we've got an insurgency going on, and then the battalion rolls in in December of two thousand five, and we come in, and we were we were in the we were actually ripping out the first battalion of the one fifty fifth Mississippi Rifles out of the out of the uh, Mississippi National Guard, who were attached to the Marines, so that that footprint belonged to the Marines up until we came in. And then that got cut to the Army and 4th ID. And you and I can talk about all sorts of craziness that occurred with that. And so we, we go into this, we go into this FOB, which is FOB Iskandaria, uh, which had, you know, this massive, uh, we, we were basically on the FOB to protect, protect the largest oil burning power plant in Iraq. But it, we were really an economy of force for Fourth ID and, and the Baghdad mission. So my battalion, we had uh, the northwest corner of Babiel Province, right? So that's uh, just west of the city of Iskandaria, city of Musaib, down towards um, uh, oh crap. Um, I forget the city now. Down south of us, and then I had the entire Karbala Province and the southeastern corner of that and bar and so okay. that it was a big big area and we were east, we were stationed to eat the fob was east of uh, the euphrates river well the whole right. entire province of karbala is west of the river and our worst area the jerfa sucker which I mean, you just gotta you just google jerfa sucker and figure out what a shithole that place is um and always was a uh, you know, that was west of the river as well. And we had one bridge to get us over the river. And when we were there, it was a, when we started, um, the insurgents had blown a huge hole in the, in the highway bridge. And so we had a, we had a ribbon bridge across the Euphrates that we were, we were transitioning. So any movement we made across the river was watched, right? And they, they knew when we were coming west of the river. And so, so that's kind of, that gives you kind of the geographic spectrum of what we were dealing with. But that's the, large, the, sir. It's that's a large area. Large, and then and then the the you know if you want to call the demographics of the area were as complex as the geographical nature of it, right? So we had we used to say we had three fights in AO. I, I mean, right? I, I just just for a scope for for the audience listening, you're you're basically and you'll appreciate this as a Jersey guy. You're basically being asked to to cover the entire area of the Jersey Turnpike from the north of the state down to the Delaware Memorial Bridge, right? Uh, and, and everything in and around it, which is a large swath for, you know, just a brigade-sized element. That, that's a lot of territory to cover with any sense of, you know, normalcy that you can actually really, on a day-to-day basis, affect operations. Yeah. And the drivers are as bad. <laughs> so, yeah. They don't have an easy pass lane. That's a problem. <laughs> no, it's terrible. <laughs> and, and, so, and, then, and then when you look at the people makeup, right? We were dealing, we, mm-hmm. we would talk about three different fights. We were fighting in Karbala. It was the Badr organization that was the problem. And they were in a sanctuary because we had no combat power to really affect them. So Badr built into the Karbala structure, right? So a Shia group 
uh, really Iranian elite connected uh, run in Karbala. Musaib in South, so we had the Shia Sunni fault line running through RAO. And so the bridge actually was right along the Shia Sunni fault line, right? So if you went north of the bridge, you were in the Sunni area of Jerfa Sucker. And uh, that was really an Al Qaeda Sunni familial um, stronghold. And it was a stronghold. We had to fight our way in there, fight our way out every time we went in. We ended up putting a combat outpost into into Jerf uh, early on in the in the in the mission, and we ended up building a police station that gets blown up twice. It was it's fantastic. Yeah. And then south uh, of the bridge was this J. Shalmati, uh, this J. Shalmati capability. Um, and let me plug my let me plug my computer back in. The uh, and while, while while you're doing that, I'll add one other thing that was just so for those listening. Um, that was a major sort of uh, event in Iraq at the time was the bombing of the Samara Mosque in February of 2006, which yeah. I was there for. And you have to remember, you know, the, as I said, there's a Sunni versus Shia violence, but there was a big contingent where they tried to blame it on the Americans. Like we were the ones who did this. We were in charge. You know, there was a lot of finger pointing going on. Uh, and the, the, again, I, I stress the, the, the level of violence that was happening on a daily basis. Uh, you're talking about, you know, um, uh, fuel tankers being blown up in the middle of markets, killing hundreds, burning hundreds of people alive um, almost on a weekly basis. Uh, and it was you, you had no idea really who was responsible for any of it. And of course, we were the biggest bad guys in town. Right. So it was easy to always blame us. And we had to throw our hands up and say, hey, we're just trying to help. You know, I mean, so just to add that sort of, uh, you know, into the context of what was going on when you guys got on ground. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, General Powell makes the comment of the, you know, the, the pottery barn thing, right? We, we decided it was a war choice. We went in, we took over the country, and we didn't bring enough force with us to actually secure it, right? And Shinzeki tells Wolfowitz, you know, what tells Congress, you're going to need 300,000 plus soldiers to secure Iraq. Uh, Wolfowitz tells Congress the next day that Shinzeki's off his rocker, you know, completely uh, uninformed by, uh, by, by military judgment, right? And well, I mean... Shinzeki comes out of that conversation uh, pretty well, you know, in hindsight, Wolfowitz pretty bad in hindsight, but exactly. So the sectarian violence explodes. Right. And so we had in the battalion, we got a welcome, we got a welcome to, uh, to Iraq IED attack on us uh, two days before we can did our, did our, uh, our transition of authority. And I had Aaron Forbes was killed. And that was the 28th of December, 2005. We had a, we had an Iraqi interpreter killed with uh, with him, and then that platoon leader, who you know, to his credit was in the lead truck uh, that, that took the blast. Uh, you know, he got medically evacuated, and we, he eventually heals and comes back about nine months later and comes back in the theater, which was which was pretty good morale wise. But between that, we didn't have another we didn't have another KIA until April, and so um, let me ask you about your first really KIA this, though, real quick. This lull. So Sorry yeah. to cut you off. I just want to ask you, because again, we, you're just given your experience and not having the combat experience, you know, um, you, you go to, to Bosnia and everything else, but there's a certain level of that first KIA that rings in your ear that you'll never forget. And it, obviously, because you knew his name right away. Uh, but not only that, it just, it, it brings reality and mortality to the forefront going, okay, um, bad stuff's about to happen. How are you personally dealing with that? What did you say to your troops? Yeah, first off, that yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and everybody's got to kind of wrestle with that. And and the 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 challenge I think across time is as you unfortunately in this profession you you get introduced to death in many in many ways pretty quickly, right? We had we had soldiers killed in two seven two armor when I was in Korea one in a one with three rollover. Uh, we had a, we had an incident on a range where we had tanks, uh, Calfex tanks supporting an infantry assault into the objective. The infantry guys hit the hit the trench line. They instead of going right, they go left. They come right up into a into a, a grazing fire from an M1 that's uh, suppressing the objective. And you know, one guy is killed, and another guy is wounded pretty badly. And then um, and then when I was in Bosnia with 11 Cav, 11 Cav had the first KIA in Bosnia, that was Sergeant Dugan. 
And then on our, and that, that's right in the beginning. And it's right before I joined the squadron. I'm, I'm in booting and trying to get down to, trying to get down to Bosnia. And then on our way out, we have Staff Sergeant Mussarelli killed in a truck rollover in Croatia as we're coming out. And, uh, and, and I can remember, you know, especially with the Mussarelli incident, because I was, the, I was the battle captain and I'm, we're actually communicating through relays over the mountain range from Gradacic, which is south of the post of Vienna corridor across the mountain range into Croatia, where this has happened in Slavonsky Brod. And we're getting all sorts of panic phone calls from higher headquarters. They want you know, it's the it's the same thing we always end up dealing with at, the, at a lower echelon, right? You know, your higher headquarters wants to know exactly everything right now. And I can remember being in the talk and getting the unknowable questions, right? What's happened? What's going on? You know, you're like, hey, we're working through it. We're communicating, right? And we get a call from Tazor Hungary, where the Fifth Corps TAC is, and it's the Corps commander wanting to know know the details and, and you know and we had probably Mussarelli had been pulled out of the truck for about 30 minutes and and we're getting a, a three-star general trying to ask us and, and we're and we're 70 miles or something from the event and and so that actually kind of prepares you, you know, unknowingly kind of prepares you for that event and uh and the need to remain calm and and I can remember I can remember a, a whole slew of times and just watching folks not be able to operate and process what's going on because they, they allow um, the horror of the moment to just kind of take them over. And I was just, and, and you know, I, I, you'd have to ask guys who are around. I think I was pretty good in just taking the deep breath, right? I used to, I used to tell, I used to always tell lieutenants, and before you make the contact report on the radio, take a deep breath, right? <laughs> and then you go, hey, this is, you know, red one contact RPG, you know, time out, in, time now, uh, out, right? Because nobody wants to hear the, the screaming guy on, on the radio, right? And I knew that I, if I <laughs> didn't take that breath, I was going to be that screaming guy on the radio. The same thing in the talk, right? I mean, I can remember being in the talk as this is reported. And, uh, and then my Sergeant Major and I kind of, and he had been he had been the SAR major one six seven for a while. Uh, Barnett, a fantastic, fantastic individual, and and so yeah, he kind of he and I like kind of look at each other and we we're talking a little bit and we're like okay, well let's let's go. And so we got in the Humvees and we went out uh, to the incident site. And there's 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 not there's not a lot you can do, right? I mean, you know the event has happened and now you're and now you're trying to work through it. Did you? There's not a lot you, you can learn. do, but being there is important. The physical presence of you being there is paramount, right? Because it just says it's important to you to other people. Yeah, I know, absolutely. I mean, you you can't you can't shy away from you can't shy away from that. Now, I will tell you the other side of that though is you know fast forward to the first of May, two thousand six, and Robbie Light's killed in a uh, in an M one tank. He's deeply buried IED on Route Patty, uh, cracks the hull of the M one. And it literally, from the description of it, turned Robbie Light inside out from the force of the blast. He's the tank driver, right? So he's down, down in the hall. And uh, I can remember walking up to the tank, and and I'm, I'm probably like 15 feet from the tank, and I, and I don't remember who it was, but it was a staff sergeant stops me and he goes, "Hey, look, sir, you, you don't need to see that." And and I can remember, I can remember kind of looking at him and saying, "Yeah, you're, you're right." I said, you know, I just kind of talk to me, how are you guys doing? You know, what, what else, what else do we need? You know, do we have enough AH-64 support, right? And then going back and getting in my Humvee and, uh, yeah, I just kind of monitor the radios and then finally heading back to the fob. But you know, do you do, wish you had gone on to see it? A- absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I know guys who sought out, you know, I, it's probably not fair to call it war porn, but the, you know, the guys who were, oh, I'm going to go see the dead bodies. I'm going to go see my guy who's, you know, you know, in the, you know, infirmary and we're getting ready to bag him so we can put him on the hero flight. I don't think you gain a lot from that. And, and I think what you do, what you do end up there is you just fill your rucksack of, of, of things you're going to have to think about later on in life. That you have to unpack later, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. if it's not going to help you in the moment, it's not going to help you 
you know, deal with the, what you've got to do for the organization. There's, there's no requirement to go up and say, yeah, I saw the, I saw the very broken body. I, you know, I saw that and therefore I'm, I'm somehow I, I've, I've touched the face of God or something. I mean, you just, you don't, yeah. you don't need those things. I, what was weird for me, and this was just me, I had no problem walking up to go see the bad guy fallen, right? Like, it was almost like confirmation for me in my brain. It was like, okay, all right, that's we're done here kind of deal. I never had a desire to go see any of my guys. And granted, you know, I didn't, none of them really got hurt, but other guys that were around me, you know, you know, some some SF guys who went on missions and got banged up, you know, I would go check on them a day or two later when they were laying in, you know, uh, on a gurney somewhere and getting getting treatment. But I, I I think it was that for me was more of looking at the bad guy for confirmation and understanding that okay, we, we move on from here now. It wasn't so much an idea of like war porn, but I I get what you're saying because I could still there there are vivid memories that I still have that I almost kind of wish I didn't have. Right. And, and I don't think you need to search them out. That, and that's my right. point. When it's, when it's, when you're, when you're not confirming that the enemy is dead, then you've got to do that. If, if it's not something you need to go see, you, I, I would recommend not going to see it. Right. Cause it's just going to add to that. <laughs> right. You, sure. you know, you know, you know, X individual is dead. Um, that, that happens. And, and, and you gotta, you, now you gotta care for the living. And I, what I learned through the first couple of months of combat was it was, it was really important to figure out quickly how to how to care for the living, and we we did not do a very good job early on of getting support to soldiers who had gone through some incredibly traumatic events, and then uh, whether that the, whether that was the loss of one of their their own members of their squad or their platoon, uh, or was where they had visited violence on somebody in a really horrific yeah. way, right? And uh, and war is fraught with with horror. Right. And, uh, you know, the crucible of ground combat is a, is a horrific place. And when you can try to try to minimize that for individuals who are going through that, uh, it really is your responsibility to do it. And, and we, I don't think we really understood that early on in 2005 well, and six. Yeah. I mean, I asked this question often. I do want to get to the actual, you know, day yeah, in July, we'll but get to the fight. You know, I, I, I want to ask this question because it's important to ask because, you know, look, I was somebody who, no matter what happened, the next day I was strapping on and I was going out the door if that's what needed to be done. I, there was no no questions asked, no, no, hey, you know, I, I probably need to sit this one. Like, I implored more of my guys to go sit one out. I'm like, you need to take a break. You've done too many of these. You need to take a break. But I never allowed myself to take a break just because I was in a leadership role. Right. Um, that said, I also never once bothered to give myself some time to decompress when bad stuff happened. And I ask this of, of all my guests all the time when they, you know, in retrospect, if you could have, do you wish you could have said, look, I need like 72 hours alone to just go talk to somebody and figure this out. Would it have helped? Would it have done more damage than good? With, with the benefit of hindsight, it's okay to say one way or another. I'm just kind of yeah. curious where you, where you sit on it because I genuinely believe if we had known what we knew now and did that more often, been like, okay, you know, it's kind of like when a cop gets, you know, it gets into a shooting, they take his badge, take his gun away, he's sitting on a desk, you know, until they feel like he's ready to come back in. We never yeah. did that. We never hit a pause. And I think in certain cases for certain people, it was a detriment. Uh, no, absolutely. And so I, I will talk about myself because I, I was never really in, you know, kind of the, the the real personal engagement. I mean, I, you know, we were struck right. by IEDs and, you know, much sure. and, and contact and everything else, but we were never really in, in kind of a really horrific environment. But I'll, I'll talk about two guys who were that were in the battalion. And, and I don't think we we didn't do right by him in a couple of ways. It was when Aaron Forbes was killed. So that's again, 28, 28 December 2005. Um, when we finally got that platoon back on the back on the fob, and it was probably f six hours after the event, so it's you know kind of early morning. We had had them outside the wire too long after the event. We should have gotten them back, and we learned that lesson. But then what we didn't do with them is you know we we had the chaplain go down and talk to him. We, we were working through the rudimentary how do you deal with the post traumatic event, right? Right. How do you how do you have guys reconcile what they've been through with what they've still got to mm -hmm. do? Well, we, we waited too long to put them back out the wire. And then if you were a soldier in that group, you could self-select and say, yeah, I don't want to go. And so then we, at a very, very low level, we allowed the approval of, hey, yeah, just Jones doesn't need to go out. So keep Jones in. Well, we ended up chaptering one of those guys 
was out, uh, you know, halfway through the deployment uh, okay. because he, he ended up, he didn't, he never went out of the wire again. And then he started to have all of this, you know, negative behavior, right? Uh, you know, criminal, you know, UCMJ behavior on the FOB. And the, the, the best and easiest solution at that point was to get him out of theater, but with this really negative mark on his record that he had, you know, gotten, you know, we were sending him out for disciplinary reasons when really it was a mental health reason. And we had, and had we forced him out of the wire 17, 72 hours after the event, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Right. And so as we got in the further in and we had more, more, issues, uh, you know, more, more casualties, 17 killed in 167 armor in, in the 0506 rotation. And, um, and so we, we had a program where we brought, we got them in quickly from the event, got the psychological team in, got the, got the, you know, the chaplain in, you know, got them all talking and got them through it, but then they got them back on the patrol roster and they were out, they were out 72 hours later. Uh, through all that fear, right? I mean, they had to work through all of the the very visceral fear of, hey, now I've got to go back out. I got to return. But then when they get back in from that patrol and it was, you know, a non-event, then they're okay. I can deal. You know, they, you can kind of see it, right? You know, the, hey, okay, I can I can do this. I can deal with this, right? And uh, and and so we had to do that. I had a senior leader involved in a in an in an IED event where. Uh, two of his soldiers were two of the soldiers in the vehicle with him were killed, and and he was he was very very lightly wounded, um, and when I met him on the ground at the event, and and I, I wasn't I wasn't doing this purposely, but he stayed with me for a long period of time, out on the ground with the smoking vehicle and the whole bit. And, and that was a mistake. I should have I should have treated him like any other soldier and put him back on. Yeah, hey, you're heading back. Rest of the patrol is going in. You're going in with them. Then you're going to be part of this process and everything else. And sometimes you forget about that with with rank and so. And I and I and and that did not do well for him. And that was not helpful for the battalion. And we should have. Yeah, you know, I, I, I now in hindsight I, I know better that hey, I absolutely should have immediately gone. No, hey, you're going with everybody else. I'll see you when I'll see you when we get back. And, uh, and and so those those are real lessons learned about how, how you deal with that stuff, and uh, and we had the opportunity to do it right. I mean, you know, even with even with the pace of violence that we were experiencing, it was you still had the ability to do that. And when you when you can do it, you got to do it, and then you got to you get then you got to turn them and get them back out of the wire, and, and they got to go face they got to face the elephant again. Incredible stuff. And listen, it's, it's, it's genuine and it's honest to hear you say, you know, uh, and acknowledge that, you know, there are things that you could have maybe should have would have done differently and, and hope for better results. Um, I got a whole bag of them. Yeah. <laughs> I got 23 years sitting in a yeah. bag somewhere as well. I'm yeah. chasing you by 10, but yeah, they're, they're following me wherever I go. Uh, that said, you know, but I, I think it's just an important discussion uh, yeah. to have because as we continue on, um, and, and by no means do I think, well, kinetic operations have slowed at this point in time. Do we ever going to stay static in this position where, Hey, we're kind of not really in combat anymore. We're, we're probably heading more closer back towards that direction than, than not. That's definitely a different conversation for a different day. Yeah. But, you know, you'd mentioned how many guys you'd lost on the deployment and yet not a single person on the 22nd of July, 2006, which I, I again, I'm still sort of marveling at cause I, when I read about it and I put the whole thing together in my head, it feels like fucking chaos. Like it felt like eight hours of just nonstop chaos. And I'm sitting here waiting as, as I'm reading this. And, and you, if you want, you can read, um, you know, about this. And, and you know, so you, you, you pointed me to this called Tip of the Spear. Um, there's a document out there. If anybody's interested on it, just hit me up at, on hazardground.com and I'll, I'll send it out your way. But, you know, I'm reading this whole thing going through, okay, when's a bad shit happen? When's, when's, a bad, when, when's, 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 when's the bad stuff happen? And at every turn, it just was like, okay, they got out of it. All right, they got out of it. Okay, they got out of it. Like, you know, it was, it was almost like a script to a movie that was so predictable in the ending. Oh, the guy falls in love with the girl and they live happily ever after. It was, <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, I'm waiting for the, for the, for the plot to thicken, but it, it never does. So I want you to sort of, you know, take us through the day. But, but I also would like to, for, for you to speak on first because, you know, this isn't talked about enough, especially when I talk to senior folks. The amount of faith and trust that you had to have. I mean, you're talking about a second lieutenant, Ryan Kelly, who, you know, kind of kicks this whole thing off. 
And, and there's a certain amount of, you know, I know when, when you get the call as a battalion commander or brigade commander and the bad stuff happened, you're, you're, you're starting to unmedi a piece like, okay, who did what and how did we get, like, you know, where did all the dominoes fall and trying to figure out, not necessarily who screwed up, but like, okay, what was the catalyst for all this and, and could have it been avoided because now I got to deal with crap afterwards. So, yeah. you know, I, I, th- there's a whole context of this thing with you as a leader with these young lieutenants and captains who are out there doing yeoman's work until you get on the scene yourself. I, I, I mean, I kind of want you to just speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was the 22nd of July, 2006. And you know, we, we like to joke in the, in the death dealer battalion that it started like any other day. Right. And we were, you know, the night patrols would come in, you're getting ready to send out the morning patrols. And all of a sudden we get this uh, kind of panicked phone call from uh, the police chief uh, down in city of Musa. And it's kind of garbled and we're not really sure what he's talking about. And so uh, Ryan Kelly was out with his platoon out of Delta Company, and they had the city of Musaid east of the river. Uh, Delta Company uh, commanded by Irvin Oliver, who was uh, fantastic. Uh, I, I, I just I was blessed with some really great, really great company level leaders. And, uh, and, and Ryan was a really good, you know, really good platoon leader. Um, but, but he learned some lessons this day as well. Right. And so we'd say, hey, go down to the police station and find out what's what's going on. And this was, you know, you know, prior to, you know, they bring in the 14, you know, uh, predators to look at the city, right? And so, you know, so it's, it's World War II, right? I mean, go close with the situation and develop, right? And, uh, and so Ryan, uh, Ryan gets out there and he gets down to the police station and the police and the police uh, commanders tell him, ah, the Jaysh al-Mahdi is seizing the city. And they are, they're at the big mosque in uh, the main square, and so we just tell Ryan, go there, <laughs> which may not have been, Thanks, the, best, may not have been the best idea. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> it was like, hey, Ryan, go, go drive through the circle and find out what's going on. And so, so sure enough, Ryan and four Humvees hits the, hits the circle. And, uh, and there's an agitated group of folks near the mosque. And, uh, and he takes RPG fire uh, at close range from multiple directions uh, against his patrol. And thank God they all miss, right? Uh, you know, thank God for bad mark- marksmanship of a ill-trained yeah. group of thugs, right? And, yeah. uh, and so then Ryan, you know, they return fire and, and they accelerate through the, through the circle and, and, and they develop the situation, but they move out through it, do all those things, uh, you know, react to contact really, really well. And, uh, and then the decision is, and, I was, and at this point, I'm in the talk and we're calling brigade. I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting, you know, I'm in the back of the talk with a styrofoam cup of coffee and the battle captains are making, making it happen, right? And uh, Ty Bonner, the XO is, you know, he's got the fight and he's, you know, he's, he's getting, like he always did, getting everything right in the right, right position. And we're, we're getting all the help we can. And But the decision really. Hang on a second, sir. We're, 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 we're losing you here for a second. I, I don't want to lose you here. We're, we're, we're getting all choppy. Yeah, Mark. You got me? I still got you. Okay. I think you still got I just I wanted kind of you to start from after you were talking about Bonner. We'll edit it out and fix it. But yeah, we, we you chopped up on us. So I wanted to make sure I got you. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the talk and, uh, and Ty Bonner, who's the XO, I mean, he's just, he's just orchestrating all the, you know, bringing in all the enablers we can get, you know, getting everybody up. You know, we're, we're, we're now spinning up units on the installation and off, right. Cause we got, we got guys out on patrol. We got, we got a, a patrol base out in Drift Sucker and we're, we're now trying to try to figure out what kind of combat power can we, can we get up and into the fight. But really, the the decision at that point uh, for me was, um, you know, what do we do? Do do we pull out of the city and then kind of negotiate, or do we go? And and fortuitously, we had there had been a couple of these little Mahdi uprisings around the country, and so we had gone through the planning of okay, if this happens in Musaib, how do we do it? Right? How do we take Musaib back? And, uh, and so we had developed a plan and, and think your planning is worth an awful lot because that's what we do is we just, we just, Hey, put the plan into action. And, 
and my sergeant major and I, uh, you know, we, we get our patrols spun up and they pull up in front of the talk. And I like to look at Bonner. I'm like, Hey man, you got, you got the fight. I'm, I'm going and I'm going to the police station west of the river. And uh, so we hop in the Humvees. And, and at that point, we're just flowing combat power into the city. And, uh, and it was, it, it really was a beautiful thing because it was, it was tanks and Bradleys going into the fight to take the city back. We, and we had a battalion minus of Iraqi army that were co-located with us next to our fob and, and, and the leader of that organization was, was fully in, in it with us. And he was a, he was a Shia, even though we were going against, you know, Shia in, uh, in the Jaysh al he was, he was a government guy. And so he was, he was coming with us. And, uh, and so we ended up going back into the city along three axes. And uh, it was, it, it's either the first or the second use of 120 millimeter canister uh, in, in history uh, for the M1 tank. And, and we were using canister in the, in the city against, you know, guys with RPGs and everything else. It was, it was a fantastic fight from our perspective because it was, we, we, through violence of action, we just gained the initiative and gained the upper hand uh, very, very quickly. And I think they thought we were going to negotiate. I think they really thought we were, well, now, now that they have the center of the city and they've got these police checkpoints and they're now in the hands of the Jay Shalmani, we're going to, we're not going to want to go like 2003 on them. We're going to want to talk to them. And uh, we did talk to him at about 10 o'clock at night after we'd killed 33 of them. And, uh, and it was, it was, it was wonderful, but yeah, you talk about the, you, you talk about watching the, the two tanks cross the 15 ton rated, you know, almost like walking bridge across the Euphrates in, in the city of Musaib. You know, those two tanks, they pushed down uh, an axis west of the river uh, from the police station where I ended up co-located with, um, oh, I can't remember his name. He's a, he's a, he's in a, he was a Hill of SWAT commander. Uh, Case. Uh, yeah, General Case, Case. General Case. Yeah. And so Case, Case meets me out there and then John, John Tully drives over uh, later in the day. And, uh, but Case and I, you know, we're, we're, we're at the, we're at the, we're at the police station and we're taking sniper fire. Yeah, I mean, nothing accurate. And, uh, and when I say we, the, the unit, I'm, I'm, I'm inside the building. I'm not taking anything. And, uh, and you know, General Case and I are we're probably drinking chai, talking about, you know, how we're bringing this fight together. Because Case's guys, the Hill of SWAT guys, were the dudes we're going to put into the mosque to clear the mosque once we, once we got uh, the downtown cleared. And, um, and for so, the record, for the civilians listening, the, the, the Iraqis can go into the mosque. We as Americans are not supposed to or allowed to yeah. so we may that's we, the reason we may why have we, gone, have we may have gone into that mosque that day i i, I wasn't gonna you know <laughs> split hairs on it sir i was gonna let you do that but you know but, but we there. had a whole bunch of we had a whole bunch of iraqis inviting us in which was nice the uh <laughs> but but you know we get we pushed this two tank element this tank section down this road uh to clear the western side of the the uh the river and then, you know, they're followed by Bradleys and the Bradleys, the reason you're following the Bradleys is they can elevate their 25 millimeters with HE and they can clear anybody coming off, coming off the roofs at you and uh, with, and also a coaxial machine gun. And so, you know, pretty effective team, all being that, that team, um, I want to say that's out of Charlie company, the guys we brought off of the, off the, the uh, patrol base we had up in Jerfusucker, the island. And, and they get down right at the end of, you know, right to the, to the bridge, this little 15 ton rated bridge. And they start taking a RPG fire from the rear. And those two, you know, those two NCOs, God bless them, right? They're like, hey, we're, we're taking RPG fire. And so we're going to cross the bridge. And of course, like I'm on the radio because I'm monitoring. And then I'm on the road. Do not cross the bridge. Do, do not cross the bridge. Because it's a 70 ton M1 tank. And we're going to put two of them across a 15 ton bridge. That, that math doesn't add up. No. So, I'm, so, so you need to talk about things. The only thing that went right there was, you know, God almighty was keeping the, the struts of that bridge together as we, as we put those two tanks over it and they got all the way across the bridge and the bridge remained up and the bridge, I, the bridge might be still there today. We obviously lessened the lifespan of that bridge uh, <laughs> doing that. 
<laughs> those two those two guys made that decision. No, nope, we can't stay here because we're getting RPG'd from the rear. So we're going to cross and uh, and 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 thank God it worked out, right? It, it not it may not have, right? But they took that decision and they did it, and that that's what you do in combat. Sometimes sometimes subordinates are going to make decisions and they're making it because it's the right thing for them to do, and then you support them. And thank God it worked out. And uh, yeah, and and you know, in the end, that day was phenomenal because it really squashed Jay Shalmati. Um, operating in and around Musayib for at least the rest of the time we were there. And then the, you know, the way that day ends, and this is where it gets kind of, this is where it gets kind of surreal. The end of that day, I'm in the, I'm in the Musayib district council office and we're eating barbecued chicken with members of the district council, including the office of the martyr Sadr leader, a guy named Thamar Thaban who who was the instigator of the event, right? He's the political wing of the Jay Shalmani. And I can just remember sitting there, you know, greasy fingers eating chicken and 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 he's distraught, right? Because we've just we've just crushed his organization. And he's politically liable for it, right? And you know, he doesn't know what we're gonna do. You know, I could have I could have arrested him. I could we could have done all sorts of stuff, right? And uh <laughs> so I just looked at him and I said, hey, I said, uh, just so you know, I can do this every day. And uh, I can just remember the guys just like blanched white because he couldn't, right? His organization couldn't do that. Um, but it was surreal that you're talking with your enemy, eating chicken after you've been exchanging, you know, tank gunfire, uh, you know. It seems like something out of a WWE script, you know, like, yeah. it, it's like, you know, you're just standing there and they're like, I'll do this all day long, pal. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was nuts, but that was the nature of the conflict, right? I mean, it, uh, yeah. When, when you, when you look back on it, um, you know, there's a couple other things that happened, which I found rather, you know, serendipitous, if you will. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you about one particular that, um, Captain Oliver had talked about uh, he there was a, a fuel truck or a, t- a tanker <laughs> truck coming down the road, and he was supposed to move forward, but he didn't want to move forward because he was concerned about a, a vehicle-borne IED that they were going to use the truck to blow up. He called for air support, and the air support said, "Yeah, got it. I, I could fire on him, but I need like you know clearance from somebody other than you." Um, the the other than you was Papa Juliet Delta, aka. Patrick J. Donahoe, yeah. um, you know, at the time, but you know, you, you give that, you give that command um, to blow up the tanker without really having any clear idea of whether it was a threat or not. Do you, do you ever second guess that sort of decision? <laughs> uh, since it turned out to be a water truck. Um, so no, I, that, I mean, out of all the decisions we made that day, I, I, I've got no qualms with that one, right? Sure. Irvin, Irvin's in the fight. He's asking for that because he's got this weird ass truck moving in that. And I was in my vehicle. I was transiting from the FOB to the police station at that point uh, when he calls. And all I've got is my FBCB2 screen. And I'm looking where Irvin's at. I'm looking where, you know, the Charlie Company guys are coming down. I'm watching the Bravo Company elements we got moving. And and I'm like, hey, no, hey, if Irvin, Irvin deems that thing a threat, absolutely. You know, right. And uh, it was funny that that AH-64 tape was on YouTube for a while. I don't, was it really? Yeah, I don't think it's there anymore. But, oh. but that that was there because because I can remember listening to myself. You know, I'm very calm. You know, again, take the deep breath. Going to sound cool on the radio, right? And uh, I remember <laughs> a- answering the, the pilots. Right, I authorized the destruction of the fuel truck on Route Cleveland, Papa Juliet Delta, I, I, and I authenticate Papa Juliet Delta. Roger out. Yeah, I mean. Just, you know, again, the, the kind of, but that speaks to some of the jackassery that we were doing too, right? As a, as a military, well, right? But and I also company think- Company commander I, I think, in, the, in the fight is asking for that. We got to have somebody authenticate that. You know, like, but sir, see, I could, I could come up with a dozen other leaders in that spot. Well, I need identification. I need to possibly identify, like, you know, who, who aren't that decisive in the moment. And, and in an understanding, and again, sorry, I apologize for the loaded question. Do you regret it? But I'm just kind of curious, you know, I, I wonder how the, the thought process, because- there's a lot of other people who, again, would have waited for identification. And even if they get it right, that it wasn't the threat that they thought it was, the second and third order of effects by doing nothing in that moment could be more catastrophic. 
And and I'd rather be left with, you know, and this is just Mark speaking, I'd rather be left with, I trust my guy, he made the assessment, we took it out, and we moved forward in the fight and ended up winning and getting out of there. Then the alternative of, I waited, and oh, by the way, B, C, and D happened next, and guess what? Right. You know, some, some of my guys got, got banged up because of it. Yeah, you, I mean, in that, what was going on that day, you don't take any risk, right? Until right. you're forced, you don't take any risk. Right. Uh, hey, if it, and it turned out, you know, the, the bad decisions we made about that, about that truck was it was a water truck that delivered water for the city of Musaib. And, and we went to replace it using SERP money. And we got taken, you know, my CA guys who were just rent a CA guys, right? They, they go to buy a new water truck. They buy a fuel truck. But you can't clean a fuel truck to deliver water, right? But we had already spent the money, you know, and we got rooked. I mean, we're just, we're just, we're just rubes, right? You need a couple of good Jersey mafia guys at that point. I mean, we're just, <laughs> We were just country rubes getting taken by, you know, these rookies. Right, by the locals, yeah. yeah. And, um, um, and, you know, I mean, so that's, you know, do I regret anything about destroying the water truck? Yes, we replaced it with a fuel truck, and that was really stupid. Right, exactly. Um, uh, one other thing that Hap was interested, because um, Captain Oliver was continuing to take fire after you, you had blown up the tanker, um, and he gives out this command to take out the tower, and, well, um, the the guy who took out the tower took out the wrong tower. Accidentally took out a a cell phone tower, um, and inadvertently knocked out the communication system for the Mahdi army. I mean, talk about like I said, serendipity. Like, right. oops, wrong target, uh, right consequence. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you see things like that happen, and it's almost like you know, hey, if God's not on our side, you know, who who, who would be right? Yeah, got moon nuts. Yeah, it, it um, <laughs> it, I mean, again, that day worked out worked out incredibly well for us. And, uh, and it felt really good. I mean, the end of that day, you know, I mean, you guys were coming back in the, well, I can remember guys coming in, you know, arms up in their Bradley, you know, turrets, like, uh, you know, I mean, it, it just felt good to go from this war against, you know, IED placers and getting blown up at night and, you know, and fearing what was, you know, 10 feet in front of you on the road to where you were just doing smash mouth, you know, smash mouth football and, and, and doing it really well. That was, that was really, really. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm with you because it seems like as I read it, like every, every lieutenant and every captain who was on the ground under your command at that point in time, um, seems to have, you know, either made the right decision or countered with the right decision to the first decision that they made, given what was in front of them. And it just goes back to the old adage, and we talk about the randomness of combat all the time on the show, sir, and just, you know, how you can't control. There are so many things that, and usually it ends up meaning something bad happens. But, you know, we always say, I, I've always said, just fall back on your training. Just fall back on what you train to do, and you have to believe that things are going to work out right more often than not. And I, I have not read a better of account of that happening than what happened on the 22nd of July, 2006. Yeah, and, and again, it goes back to... It's not just captains and lieutenants. It's a whole host of sergeants that make that sure, fight. Sure, right. Happen, I mean, right? 100%. And, yes, and sir. it's, you know, the guys in the lead tanks, that's normally a staff sergeant. He's got a, he's got an E4 or E5 gunner, and, and they are just, you know, they're just bringing the scunion, right? And and it's incredibly well done. The, the squad leaders who are getting out of the Bradleys and, and, and in conjunction with the Iraqi army, just clearing, you know, building after building as we're working our way towards the main, the main portion of the, the city, I mean, just incredibly well done by, 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 by everybody on the team. And it, it was good because it, they did. It really all came together that day, and they all did extremely well. You know, they played, they played above their game, right, which was, which was great. But we had, you know, there were a series of failures. Ryan Kelly in the middle of the intersection has two of his 240s fail. Yes. Dirty ammunition, right? And, um, and so, you know, we, we took that back. We're like, all right, what are we doing? How are we cleaning our information, you know, our ammunition? You know, because you were in this – you were in this environment where you had the same box of ammunition on your truck and you were, you were just using the same box day after day after day, you'd pull it down, put it in the vehicle, but it's getting dustier and dustier, right? So how do you clean ammunition? And then do you need to, do you need to clean it all the time or do you just need to take it out in the desert and shoot it, right? And so that's, we started, we started doing a lot of rotating guys out and because we had, we had the benefit of open desert to our West. So we'd send guys out and they would, they would go out and they would shoot ammunition just to keep their, keep their edge up. But also it was good because 
if they had dirty ammunition, everybody kind of figured out what had happened. And then they, then it, it just ingrained in everybody this responsibility to keep their, keep their systems ready, you know, at all times. Cause you, you nobody woke up that morning on 22 July thinking that was the day. Right. And so mm-hmm. you gotta be ready every day. Right. And so you know, that's, and that's the responsibility of, you know, uh, tactical leaders at the, you know, squad and platoon that make sure and, com- and company and make sure they are doing that every day. Battalions have got to state the policies and make sure that they're they're checking it and they're driving those those readiness uh, you know levels and and verifying that folks are in, a, in adherence to it. And, uh, and so yeah, we learned you know the battalion learned a tremendous amount that day as well. It was it was uh, it was good. It was beneficial for, uh, for us. And thank God we we walked out of there without without anybody getting killed. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, apologies to the NCO Corps. It, it just when it reads, when it reads, it just says the, the captain, so and so, lieutenant, so and so made the decision. So I. It's always the yes, lieutenants I, and the captains who are going to interview with the journalists and the historians. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, the, 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 the sergeants. The good sergeants are going to say, yeah, hey, talk to the LT. I'm out of here. <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll add one other thing, and nobody ever really echoes this sentiment all that much, but I got, man, I, look. I'm not a tanker. I've been inside of them, obviously, and I, I know what they do, and I'm, I'm capable of, I'm aware of their capabilities. But, you know, how many times did one of those tanks get hit with an RPG or something, got disabled, lost power, or whatever, couldn't move the turret, and those dudes knew exactly how to troubleshoot and keep that thing in the fight. Like, it was, there was one, I, I think there was one incident where, where a tank rolled off in an embankment, had to be pulled out, um, you know, but other than that, Every one of those gun trucks, every one of those tanks was was in play for the entire time. Like that's the the other incredible part of this whole thing is that they were never able to really, you know, get any decided advantage on you guys from you know taking out a tank or even even a Humvee to that extent. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and you're absolutely right. It's the it's the immediate action drills inside the turrets, inside you know the Bradleys and the tanks, and those guys keeping them in the fight. You know, the one wounded soldier we have is a driver of a Bradley yep. RPG strikes the side gets penetrated and he gets very lightly wounded in the driver's hole. Uh, but they keep that vehicle in the fight. That vehicle never leaves the fight. It just keeps, it just keeps fighting. Yeah. You know, and I, I forget the driver's name, but God bless him. Right. I mean, he's, Hey, I got, got a bit of shrapnel in my back. All right. Where are we going? Right. I mean, this God bless him. Right. And, um, and, and so it is, it's, it's and, and you only get that through this, through this experience in the turret. And that's why, what we're doing right now, uh, I can complain about, you know, the, the fact that we're moving infantrymen from light infantry squads to strikers, to Bradleys, to Humvees, and then back, they never get the experience they need to fight the platform they're on. And we've got to, you know, we're actually, when I was the commanding general of, of the Maneuver Center, and it wasn't my idea, it was the infantry commandant and the armor commandant at the time, uh, Kevin Admiral and Dave Hodney, who said, hey, we need an MOS for Bradley crew members. And we, we got to get away from 11 Bravos uh, in the turrets of Bradley's. They just don't have the, the length of experience in the vehicles. And that's, that's where we, we absolutely have to get to so that you have uh, that, you know, that result in combat is that guys innately know what to do. Cause there's, you can't pull out the manual at that point, figure out what you got to do. You gotta, you gotta know what you gotta do. Special specialist Isaac Gutierrez was the guy. Ah, okay. who, uh... God bless him. So, yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, that deployment ends. I mean, obviously, you're going back home and, you know, uh, you know, it was just an amazing run for you guys there. Uh, obviously, and again, I don't want to underscore the losses that you took because yeah. I think that's that's super important. But all things considered, you know, it's just uh, um, it's an experience for you that's obviously, you know, a crystallizing part of your career. Uh, one that sort of, I, I think, the, began to define you as a leader, but I also think it began to set you up for what was good, what, what was to come next, right? I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, yes. Well, yes and no, right? So, you know, Mark, when you look at it, I mean, um, at, at that point, going into battalion command, I was actually going in, I was kind of a golden boy. I was, I was a two-time below-the-zone guy getting into battalion command. And, uh, and I, have a, I had a really rough start to battalion command, really rough start. Uh, our NTC rotation was, uh, um, I mean, I, I think the French call it a clusterfuck. I mean, it was terrible. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the leadership of the Army at that point, you know, it's, it's only 2005. It's, you either perform at the National Training Center or you, you're not very good. And we, we did not, as a battalion, perform well. And so there was a lot of like, oh, oh hey, what's going on with this guy? And 
and that was okay. But I, I can remember halfway through the deployment, I was getting my first OER from uh, from Colonel Tully and General Thurman. And uh, Tully wrote a really, really mediocre OER on me. Um, and and so so I called him and I said, hey, sir, I, we really got to talk. And he was like, oh, okay. And so he came over to Fabus Canaria and I said, I say, sir, this is a, this is a terrible OER. And he said, what do you mean? I said, it's a terrible OER. <laughs> And, and he's like, oh, what do you mean? I say, hey, sir, I've got 10 dead in the battalion. If, if I'm not doing something right, you, you got to tell me what I'm doing wrong. You got to, you got to help me here. Cause I, I get, I get, you know, I got blood on my hands. And if, if, if I'm this bad, you, you gotta, you, you gotta set me straight. You gotta tell me what, what I gotta, where am I failing? Right. And uh, that was a good, that was a really good conversation. Um, and you got balls, sir. I mean, I, like that's a gutsy conversation to have with an 06. No, it was, it, it, again, it was one of those things of like, hey, wait a second. if Because I had written an OER very similar to that on another guy, <laughs> right? Who I thought was absolutely My guess is absolute, you didn't think he was all that stellar. Absolutely failing, right? <laughs> and, and it was, and I had a long couple of discussions with that guy about why he was failing, what he needed to do different, right? I mean, all those kind of things. And, um, and if, if the perception, and, and again, though, I mean, the, at that point, 10 dead, I'm going to lose seven more. Right. I mean, and I don't know that at the time, obviously, but, but I've, I, right. I mean, that's a, that's a significant issue, right? Hey, if, if you think I'm doing that badly, you, you got, you either got to pull me out of command or you got to, you got to tell me what I'm doing wrong here, but you can't, you can't just give me shitty paper and, and keep walking because there's, there's soldiers on the, there's soldiers in this unit that either deserve better leadership or, deserve a course correction, you know, for their, for their leader. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, so coming out of that, I mean, I, you know, I had kind of looked, I had kind of looked at my career map in the mirror at that point too. Right. Um, and so I, when I come out of battalion command, I'm, I'm clearly not um, looked at by armor branch in the same way I was looked at going in. Right. And I actually had that conversation with uh the guy who ends up, the guy I took battalion command from, who goes on to be the armor branch chief, who ends up being the vice chief, vice chief of staff of the army, Joe Martin. And I had that discussion with him when I was home on block, when I was home on uh, mid tour leave out of, out of Iraq after my first OER. And he was just like, well, oh, hey, you know, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, at that point you were like, hey, I'm, I'm heading back into this meat grinder, right? I don't care. <laughs> I just, I got to. I got to do things for the, I got to do things for the guys in the unit, not for, not for anything else. And then, so, so when I get selected for brigade command, I get selected for a training support brigade, first army that, that is, uh, you know, affectionately known as a kiss of death. Right. And so, but you know, I had a long talk with a couple of folks and they were like, Hey, soldiers in first army need good leaders too. And then, you know, I went into that job. I went into it and I, I did the absolute best I could. It's fascinating. I mean, I told you about the, the provincial reconstruction team thing. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. there's nobody else in the army doing that. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. I had a great peer, another first army brigade command named Steve Quinn. Steve Quinn taught me all about the value of, of peer coaching and peer leadership and, you know, being a good peer. Because to be honest with you, when I was a battalion commander, I tell this to guys all the time, I don't think I was a very good peer. I had, I had a, a I had a real public, kind of, you know, disagreement with a fellow battalion commander and there, and therefore we didn't do what we, 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 we didn't work well as peers. And so we were failing the brigade and the division, and then we were failing our soldiers. Right. And if I could go back, I, I, I would have been a good peer. I would have fought through the friction between me and that guy to have been a better peer. Right. And, and so learning that in brigade command was, uh, was really, really helpful. And I, and I, I walked out of that job, making sure that whatever organization I was in after that was, I was a good peer as best I could be to my, to my wingman. And then we did, we were, we were, a we were a unit that was easy to work with, right? We didn't, we didn't fight higher headquarters on every tasking. We didn't, we, we weren't inhospitable if higher headquarters came knocking, right? We, we tried to work well with others because uh, because we I did not do that in battalion command. I was uh, especially on in in Iraq. We really we kind of coalesced around this image of being out on the frontier, and there were the 
the Pogues back at, you know, uh, Fob, uh, Calsu, where the brigade was stationed. And it was not helpful. It wasn't helpful to, wasn't helpful to the brigade. It wasn't helping to my fellow uh, battalion commanders. And, 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 yeah, I, I tell this, I tell this openly and 17 kill, killed in the battalion. I think had I been a better peer with that one battalion commander, it wouldn't have been 17, right? I, I don't know who would be alive today out of that 17, but it, I, I think had we been able to work together better, it wouldn't have been 17. And that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty heavy bag to carry. I was going to say, how much does that still weigh on you? Yeah, that's a pretty heavy bag. Yeah. Um, again, without fast forwarding too much, and, and again, I appreciate the candor. I mean, you know, look, there, there's, uh, we're all compelled to, to evaluate our performance. We're all compelled to continually um, assess what we're doing, what's going right, what's going wrong, and, and have those hard conversations with leaders and subordinates all around. Um, that, make, that makes us all better. That's, that's the, the sharpening of the knife, so to speak. Um, you know, you got to take it out of the sheath and, 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 and get it moving if you want to uh, stay on top of things. Um, are you surprised you make general officer? Oh, blown away, shocked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, the, the only reason I'm a the only reason I'm a general officer today is uh, is HR McMaster and Scotty Miller. And so, uh, when I came out of when I came out of uh, brigade command, um, I went to Afghanistan uh, to the NTMA um, advisor mission. I was the advisor to the uh, chief of the general staff. Again, there, there, no general officer came out of that job. Right, that was not you know, former brigade commander going to be the XO for uh, an American four star, right? I mean, those are the jobs that, that get you into the next, you know, the next position or a division chief of staff or, you know, actually at Ben, it was division chief of staff weren't getting you there. It was really, you had to go be a four star XO. And then, um, and then I, I, when I was coming out of that job out of Afghanistan, I got, I got Shanghai into being the director of training and doctrine at Benning for, uh, for, for McMaster. And I mean, I wanted no part of that. I mean, I, I mean, I fought that tooth and nail. It was a, it was a new job. Um, I was going to be the third person in that job. Uh, the two colonels before me both retired out of that job. Uh, one had been, it was a quote unquote former brigade command job. Uh, one guy I replaced, he was at 30 years, right? And, uh, and the guy before that had been a battalion or a brigade commander had been, been moved out of brigade command early. Um, and so, you know, I, I, and, and I had no desire to go to Fort Benning. I was like, I don't want to go to Fort Benning. Uh, I'm an armor guy. I, yeah, I got it that it's a newer center. Don't want to do it. But uh, but I was, you know, I, I went and I, and I did what the Army asked me to do. I did I did the job. I did it as well as I could. I, I was interested in the people. I was interested in what we were charged to do for the Army and for the maneuver center. And McMaster appreciated that. McMaster rec- recommended me to Scotty Miller to be his chief when he came in to replace him uh, at Benning. And... Uh, Miller and I had served together in 1st Brigade 2ID a thousand years before that. He was the Delta Company 520th commander before he goes off to Delta and ends up, you know, doing the storied career that, that he had done. And I was in second tank. So I was in the, you know, the, the tank battalion uh, next door in the, uh, in the brigade. You know, I did, a, I did a, an interview with him, you know, via, via VTC when he was in Afghanistan, getting ready to come into, into Benning. He said, hey, you're the Donahoe guy. I was in second tank. He clearly had looked at my, my ORB and realized we were there at the same time. So he thought he'd be familiar. And so I said, yes, sir, you were the Delta Company 520th guy, right? And, uh, and then, you know, I, I got along very, very well with Miller. I, you know, I tried to deliver on what he wanted done. And uh, then he, he sat the two-star board um, his second year in command in my second year as his chief. And Perkins, who was the trade out commander, was the uh, was the, the you know the uh, president of that board, that fo- that that one star board. And you know, so I think Perkins was looking for a a good news story for trade out. And uh, and I think and, and Miller's a guy who just really uh, he, you know, he'll look across the across the you know the different branches and everything else, and 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 try to pick pick talent where he sees it. And I and and I think I did everything he wanted me to do, or most of what he wanted me to do. Uh, when I was his chief. And so when I was four and a half years out of brigade command, when I got selected for one star, that's, it's virtually unheard of for a, an armor or an infantry guy to be that late. You're usually in the first or second year out of that brigade command. And so we were looking at property. I was thinking I was retiring out of the chief job and, and to be all to be absolutely honest. And yeah, you know, I, I told my mother this a thousand times, right? 
hey, I was really, really happy with my what I'd been able to do in my career as a colonel. I, I you know, I, I was if I had retired as a colonel, I would have walked out head held high, proud of proud of what my family and I had been part of and and the soldiers that I had been able to serve with uh, over that at that point, what, 27 years or whatever. I would have been okay. And then I obviously got struck by lightning and and pulled through the system, you know, given an extra six years to serve. And I hope I used those six years um, to the benefit of uh, the folks I was in charge of, you know, given the, the um, you know, the responsibility to lead. I hope I was a good peer for folks and I hope I helped advance the ball for the Army. Well, we're going to talk about the last one here in a moment, <laughs> but I will say this. Uh, H.R. McMaster, Scotty Miller. Um, yeah, those are good people to know. And uh, I have officially decided that uh, what's going to be etched on my tombstone is a guy who needed better friends. That's it. <laughs> I just needed better friends. I think I, I, if I had better friends in life, I would be comp in a completely different spot because I'm a likable guy. I just need better friends. Um, you know, I love my friends that I have, but I just need some better other ones. Um, yeah, so that's a... Uh, that's a that's the story of my existence. Yeah. It's, okay, and it's it's helpful to come into those kind of friends late in life, right before making yeah, decisions you know, are going to be made for you. <laughs> I'm still trying to make those friends at this stage. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, again, I, I didn't make enough of the right friends, at least on the military side of the house. Uh, but you know, I mean, again, I I think when you talk about advancing the ball forward, uh, and, and we'll get to the whole, you know, you're you're finishing up your career. You're at the Maneuver Center of Excellence down at Fort Benning, which, oh, by the way, in retrospect, after hearing the story about, you know, 167 armor, it's like the perfect job for you. Like, I mean, honestly, like it, if, if there was ever somebody who maneuvered, like when we talk about maneuver operate, that was it. Between all the elements that you had, like that felt like it was just like after reading it, after reading that, I'm like, okay, now I see why he got that job. That makes a ton of sense because that, you know, was your wheelhouse, right? Yeah. Fort Benning is first off, Fort I can remember having a discussion with General Abrams when I was in Korea. He was getting ready to go to the Four Star Conference. To, uh, another, another good friend to have to argue. Um, <laughs> who's, who's, the, who's the last one standing? <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, I remember having a discussion with him about you know, kind of he, he was he was you know advocating for me to go into a division, and I said, "Hey, sir, that'd be great, right?" Um, I said, "But hey, if if Benning is open, man, I, I would love to command Benning." And, you know, you can go in, you can go into the first armor division and the first infantry division, and you can change that division uh, for the two years you're going to command it. Yep. You command Benning, you, you can change the army, right? And you, you can, you can really advocate for positive change as you see it, positive change uh, in the army. And, um, it, but, but it's also uh, it, it, the command of Benning can be a little bit of a lightning rod as well, because, you're, you have, um, you should have a pretty powerful voice into the choices that the army or army is making brigade and below. And, um, and, it, and if you challenge the status quo narrative, uh, that can get you sideways with a lot of people, right? And it's a, you know, you know, the, when you get in, when you get inside the, the narrative of, you know, kind of army doctrine and how the army's going to fight in the future and how they're going to be equipped, and if you're 45 degrees out from the senior leadership, you can you can really get into some pretty heated discussions. And then it's up to you as the commanding general of Fort Benning. Are you are you willing to have those fights? Right. There was a previous commanding general of Fort Benning uh, going back about 20 years ago that said, "Hey, remember, the army burns heretics." Right. So, you know, you, you if you fight against the machine, you you got to be you got to be ready, right? And uh, and I think we did some. We did some pushing back on some of the narratives in the army and, and what the army was learning in Ukraine and, and some of those things from Fort Benning that that may not have been uh, you know, incredibly welcome. But, but I think we've got to, as an army, we've got to have those discussions and we've got to be willing to, uh, especially at the senior leadership level of the army, we got to be willing to have those discussions about what's uh, what's important, what's the what's the evolving character of war and are we as an army evolving fast enough and are we making the right choices? I'll say I'll say one thing in reference to the comment: the army burns heretics. Um, <laughs> I would I would I a thousand percent agree. Um, it's it, it's cost me certain things in my career um, just because I I spoke up about things that I was passionate about and believed in that I believed in the best interest of everybody around me, the military, the the army, the Georgia National Guard where I currently serve, and everything else. Like, but I, I don't think any of those heretics for one second would ever turn around and say I shouldn't have said that. I, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have fought for that because. That's 
part of the army values that we live, we just view it through a different lens. Yeah. That's integrity. Well, My integrity says this is what I believe and this is what I'm going to stand up for. And that's okay to dissent. The problem is, is that there is a overarching idea that, you know, the dissenters are the bad guys in the room. Right. And, and dissent shouldn't be disloyalty, right? Right. And There's, so don't, don't conflate the two. Right. If you're the senior leader, you should be able to, you should be able to logically defend your position. And if you've got a subordinate who has a different perspective and it's presented respectfully and it's well thought out, you should be willing to have that intellectual discussion. And if you're not willing to have that discussion, then you don't belong in the job, right? That nope. th this is not the and, Soviet Union. And you union. don't belong leading, right? you period. Don't, absolutely like that's, not. You, 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 you shouldn't be able to call yourself a leader because at that point, all you're doing is following what the other people before you did. You're not leading, you're following. Right. And, and the other side of it too is if we expect our senior leaders to make really tough decisions and to be intellectually prepared for the jobs they're in, you can't you can't just flip a switch at two star, three star, four star, and all of a sudden, hey, now you can speak your mind. Now you can defend your point of view. Because if you don't work on that your entire life, you're not ready for it when 100%. you're asked to be you know, yes, the sir. decision maker. All right, I'm gonna say two words and I just want you to give me your reaction in one word, two words, one sentence, two sentences. Tucker Carlson. <laughs> I, I got no real issue You've never actually met him, have you? Oh, no, absolutely not. Um, never spoke to him. No. And, and so <laughs> he's a showman, right? And he's- and he's Of course, made, he's an entertainer. He's an entertainer, as he's self-described in legal challenges to Fox News, right? Um, you know, my politics, you know, nobody really knows my politics. And I always kind of, I got, I thought that was funny when I got, you know, I got painted as this extremely left-wing, you know, woke, you know, guy- because I'm like, wow, you, you have no idea what my voting record is, but but okay, uh, let's let's have this discussion. But the, the chat, my concern with Tucker Carlson is to to boost his ratings and everything else. He's feeding a narrative that's counterproductive for the nation, right? And I think that's I think that's a dangerous place for us to be as a country. And for the record, he's not the only one. Oh, he's not absolutely not. No, he's not the only. And, and I'll say this. And Colonel Mike Jason, retired Colonel Mike yeah. Jason, says this all the time. He's he's been on the show here. They love us until they don't. Right. And right now they don't. Yep. Right. Like right, they're, they're, we have been abused and used and misused. And when I say we, the military, um, a, 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 as a pawn in a political game for the better part of the last decade. And it is it is starting. It feels like and I, don't, I can't say for sure. You might have a better perspective, but it feels like it's starting to tear us down from within. Oh, there's there are there are a whole host of currently serving soldiers, active duty, National Guard Reserve that are, uh, that are working against the institution uh, based, on this, based on this insidious narrative that's, that's coming out of the, the, the very far right. And it's, uh, it, it is, it's dangerous for the army, it's dangerous for the country. Um, the extremes of both, both political extremes are dangerous for the country. Um, the more they gain traction, the, the more dangerous they become, obviously. Yep. And so, you know, my concern with with Tucker Carlson is that he's he's using the the pulpit that he's built through, you know, through a lot of hard work and long hours and, you know, all of those things. But he's using it to f to further break the nation apart as opposed to try to bring the nation together. And there's some of the things that he touts he can't possibly believe. Right. And and there are just. And he's willing to he's willing to things that say things that are just factually incorrect to further the narrative, right? And so one of the things that was said about me on his show is I'm, I'm a Biden general. Well, I was promoted to one star and two star during the administration of President Trump. So how could I possibly be a Biden general, right? But, but we're, they're willing to throw that out there. And it's, it yeah, is- But it, it also, it illustrates he has no idea of the process. Right, but, he, right? but he's, he's <laughs> my, the dates of my promotions are public knowledge, right? They're in the, right, exactly, his, yes. You know, whatever, whatever goon squad he's got in the back room doing the internet stuff. Doing the research, they can, they can do it well. They can figure that out in a second, right? And so, but it doesn't help his narrative, right? To go, hey, why is this guy making these decisions he's making? You know, given the fact that, hey, here's where his record, you know, here, here's where he's been in his career. I mean, it just- it's just it's just crazy, right? And then I I think what's unfortunately the the army as an institution is really uh, unprepared to kind of deal in this space, and so the, they're so uncomfortable with it. Oh my god, yeah. And so we're it's much like riding on a bicycle with no seat. I mean, it, yeah. they just they they have no. 
And, and the problem for me is, sir, and this is this, the problem for me is that they don't want to get comfortable. They want to just kind of, oh, it's over here, and we'll just keep churning out and doing what we do, and things are going to be fine. Let's not, at some point in time, if you continue to ignore the problem, it's going to become too much of a problem for you to ignore. And, and th- there needs to be some point where senior leadership attacks this head on. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the, when you go into the, the, whole, the whole, you know, Twitter gate thing that happened with me, right? Um, I've used Twitter for a long time. I've had the account since 2009. Um, you can go back. I've written articles about it. I've been interviewed about it before the whole thing happened about what I was using Twitter to do. And it was all about communicating with soldiers in their space, yep. uh, gaining, gaining insight to what soldiers were, soldiers, junior leaders, we're doing, et cetera, right? Gaining, gaining insight into you know populations I may not have a, a you know a, a deck plate understanding of, right? So that's women in armor and infantry. I, I mean, I'll take their input because I don't, I've never served in that capacity, so it's valuable for me to understand that perception or that that perspective. And so you know, so I, I put all that out there. And then what happened here was, you know, I I came out. Uh, Tucker Carlson, you know, ran a, a segment about. You know, it was really demeaning towards women in, in the military. Yes. And because um, mm-hmm. they wear pregnancy, uh, now OCPs. God, God forbid we give a. We've give had a, pregnancy a, uniforms us, for 25 years. Right. I mean, God forbid we give women a, a uniform that fits them correctly, right? Um, I and mean, if we gave guys ill fitting boots, you know, we'd, we'd be hung, hung out to dry, right? And so, it, you know, so really demean, and he used the uniform thing to demean the service of women in the uniform. Uh, women in uniform was making us weaker and it was making us less uh, militarily capable, less lethal than what you see in, in China and Russia. Well, as we watch Russia impale itself on a, you know, on Ukraine, uh, I, you know, I'm pretty confident we wouldn't have those problems uh, that they're, they're having. We'd have, we gotta be, we gotta be cautious to just say, we don't have any of the problems the Russians have, but you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems they've got. And a lot of it's because we've, we've allowed We've allowed people to serve who have the capability to serve. And we need everybody who's willing to serve and can serve well and honorably and capably. We we need them to serve, especially in an all volunteer force. Yes. We don't have conscripted service. Right. <laughs> and and so, you know, and, you know, we're we're at something like 115 female graduates of Ranger School now. You know, I didn't go to Ranger School. I mean, I'm told it's hard. So, you know, I mean, that. That speaks to capability. Allow people to rise to their level of ability and competence. You put artificial barriers to talent into the system, then we're not going to get all of the talented folks we need to take on adversaries who, frankly, outnumber us five to one. You look at the Chinese and the Russians, they outnumber us five to one. We, we need everybody who's capable of effectively carrying a rifle to be able to do that if they want to do that. A hundred percent. And again, you know, I, I don't, uh, like I said, as far as anybody asking, the, what happened is, is out there. It's you can read it. You've, you've spoken on it before. I don't, I don't think we need to speak on it yeah. again. I don't, I don't think there's I think, much value to I the think conversation. The, the bigger problem, because that, that should have been a, that, that should have been a, you know, I, I get a phone call from, you know, somebody in my chain of command. Hey, what are you doing? What's going on? How can we do that? Of course, I'm in, pretty, yeah. I'm in pretty good company in that whole thing. Right. But right. Okay. I think what, what, what's more problematic for the army is the long drawn out um, investigations that we are now, we're now doing, right? And so- We, are, we have become a litigious military where we investigate everything to death and right. it's annoying. But, but, but more problematic is we've taught subordinates and, and the guys who came after me were colonels. We've taught subordinates to weaponize all of these systems because you don't like a decision that's being made. That decision is, it's, it's legal, it's ethical, it's moral. You just as a staff guy disagree with it. You, you, just, you just have to execute at that point. You've given your input. The, the leader has weighed your input, made a decision. Now let's go do this. And what we've now given um, folks who disagree with decisions is, well, then I'll just go to the IG and complain about X, Y, and Z. I'll call this guy toxic. I'll call this dude, and then I'll throw this social media thing on top of it. There's the buzzword, toxic. Yeah, yep. and, and, and we, instead of being, the only reason you and I, are, Mark, the only reason you know my name is we couldn't get an investigation done in 14 months. It took the Army 16 months to investigate something pretty, pretty cut and dry, right? Hey, it all came down to all the toxic stuff, all that stuff, all of it's, all of it, 
all the, you know, within five or six interviews, the IG would say, hey, that's, you just got a couple of kernels that, that don't appreciate the decisions that have been made. Okay, that's, maybe I should go talk to those guys, try to bring them back on the team. I'll, I'll work, you know, uh, I'm not a perfect leader by any stretch of the imagination. Maybe I, maybe I, would, I wasn't a, a tremendous team builder with those guys. But we then said, hey, now we're going to focus in on the social media stuff. Hey, the social media stuff was done in the full view of my chain of command. Mm -hmm. That should have never gone to the IG. The IG should have referred that back to the chain of command and said, were you aware? And then my chain of command, if they were honest, would have said, yes, we were fully aware because we're, you know, we're, we're watching, you know, I'm following Donahoe on Twitter, you know, so I'm seeing everything he's doing. Yep. Yeah, and I disagreed with, yeah, you know, and I, I've self-admitted. There's an exchange I have on a Saturday morning with a, with a troll, not my best work. Shouldn't have done it, right? <laughs> I've been upfront about that since day one. I, I've tweeted 30,000 times since 2009 when I opened that account. I've got two of them that morning. Yep, shouldn't have done it. You know, come get your boy because the guy was an ass. Come get your boy. And, and then some asshole rolling in with, you're... You know, you're how many how many wars have you lost, General? Right. Of course, that's a Putin. That's a Russian propaganda talking point. So I did. So I shot back at that. Don't be the shill for Putin. That's true. Might not be tasteful. Right. May not be the decorum expected of a two-star general in public. Okay, I'll take that ridicule. I'll take that correction. But it's true because that's Russian propaganda. Right. Because by the way, we've we've won a we've won a bunch of wars since the Second World War, my good friend. Right. right? Yeah. We've run a couple of them. Right. Yeah. And so. Um, so then you kind of get into the whole discussion. and a whole bunch of other engagements that technically yeah. weren't a war, but that's right. Here I mean, it's just, it's just, we, we, it's we just, need to get into it. It's just garbage, right? Uh, right. By those guys. But we've got you know that that should have been back to the chain of command. The chain of command said, "Yep," and we we talked to them about it. And we're they never suspended me from command. Are, they didn't relieve. Are me from you command. are you disappointed that none nobody in the chain of command stepped up above uh, you know a three or four stars? I got this. I got it. Like. Hold the investigation. I got this. Like, and, and somebody, sh I've, that, that's what, for me, okay, like when it comes down to that and it's one of my folks, that's the first thing I say to my boss. Let me handle it. Let me, I got it. Let me handle right. it. Give me your left and right limits here. Give me what you think. Let me handle it though, because I can handle this. But I, I get distant, because that to me it feels like, and again, I'm not, uh, I'm not versed enough to speak at this level, right? I'm not a three-star general. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, there's, I assume there's a high level of bureaucracy there and there's a high level of, you know, we've got to stay tight to what we do, you know, kind of deal. But in the same respect, there's just a general feeling. You don't leave your guys behind. Like you don't leave your, like that is paramount from E1 to O10. Leave nobody behind. Don't leave your guys out there pissing in the wind with no help. And, and that's what, seems to irk me about the whole thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, sure. Would I have liked, you know, a, a currently serving four star to stand up and publicly defend me? Sure, that would have been, that would have been wonderful. Um, but in reality, the, the, the challenge the army has is you know, with these things that are, you know, at the beginning, you know, I, the vaccine wasn't, it wasn't a political issue. No. At the beginning of the vaccine, right? It, it, it evolves into one, right? And, and we were not, we, we often aren't on the uptake of how, a, how something works, for, works its way from, you know, non-political to political, right? And we, I clearly was behind that power curve as that thing became, became political as we're out there advocating for it, et cetera. Matter of fact, the, the interaction I have with this guy, we had had a conversation with leadership in my organization above me, leadership in my organization, about getting out, you know, being proactive about messaging about the vaccine, et cetera, right? And so I, I thought I was kind of, you know, doing a lot of that. And I was, and I'm, I'm a believer in the vaccine. So if you're not a believer in the vaccine then you're, you're, you don't believe in science and, and therefore I, I think you should probably read more deeply about it. And so you, you get to this point of it became political and then all of a sudden, you know, you get drug into this, into this morass and then the uh, four stars just go to ground because they, you know, they're, they're, they're ensconced in the building and they're looking at the two political factions that they've got to deal with every day. And it's just, re and I've never worked in the Pentagon and, um, and, but I mean, I've talked to, talked to a whole host of really good people who work there and this, it is just really hard to be a military leader in the Pentagon with the current state of American politics. And 
therefore it would have not been helpful to the institution for you know a four star to come out and publicly defend me and 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 those are calculations that the the leadership of the army has to make they make them they make them routinely um but but they I, I get they gotta, it. I get it. They got the honest. I get it. And I agree. I get it, and I agree. Like at some point, you have to bite your tongue for the betterment of the institution. God, I just wish there was somebody who would have set up balls that would have done something. Yeah. Like it, it just I, I, that would have garnered the ultimate respect from everybody who wears uniforms. Says, "I want to go serve with that dude." Right? Plain and simple. And, and this is my. This may be a flaw in me, but I rather would have had those people who said, "I want to go serve with that dude." Then be part of the group that says, well, he's not f- cut out for what we do, you know? And ultimately, that's what I feel is why I won't be a general officer because it, it came down to I spoke my mind. I said yeah. what I believed. Uh, I, I don't want to change anything that I said. And I often play this mental exercise with myself. Should I have been more diplomatic? Like, you were stupid. Like, you didn't have to run your mouth. Like, look, I'm a New York kid. And I, you yeah. know, at heart, I'm still a New York. Like, I got a sharp tongue. I always have, I always will. But, I, you know, I, I want to I be a general officer. It's just not in the cards now yeah. because of some decisions I've made along the way. And I have to live with that. First off, Mark, right? I mean, I, I think every, you know, second lieutenant, you know, dreams, oh, I'm going to be a general. Oh, it's going to be great. Yeah. The, I think the challenge <laughs> becomes as we go through our careers, we, we make a series of decisions along the way that either keep us on that track to be competitive or, or pull us off that track. And people make those decisions every day in the army, right? Uh, that, Hey, I'm going to go take this job. It's going to pull me off that, off that track. Matter of fact, when I got pulled to Benning, I was literally trying to get a job that would have been, it was the, the guy in uh, at the Marshall center, right? The Colonel at the Marshall center. I mean, that's a retirement job. I mean, flat out, you're, nobody's getting promoted out of that job. And I was trying to get that job. Right. And, um, and so get, you make decisions like that all the time. Sometimes you, you get that decision made for you or, or not. But then the other side of it is the luck and timing piece of it is yes, unbelievable. That's the two right? words that every general officer used yeah. to me. Luck and timing. Yeah, luck it, and it, timing. It, it is so true. Again, I go back and it's, it's my fourth look at, at One Star when I get selected because it's a, it's a different board and the guys in the room have got to know you. And if, you're, if it's in a room that guys don't know you, then you're not good. It doesn't matter how good you are. Right? You might, and by the way, everybody doesn't even get into the room, right? They select three, you know, look at 3,000 colonels or whatever we got, and they take 300 into the room on the active duty side and then got to make those determinations. But the, um, if, if you get selected and you get an opportunity to continue to serve, great, right? But don't lose yourself in it, right? And that's, that's, that's always the challenge. You got you to gotta stay true to yourself. And when I made the decision to retire, um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things, you know, I, I love the narrative out there in some circles is that I was forced to retire. I wasn't. I, I made the decision to retire in, in February and, and requested the Army uh, retire me uh, on the 1st of October. I made that request in March. And uh, it was just because I, I got to the point where I, I felt like I could better help the Army see itself on the outside, right? And that's part of what I'm trying to do with my life, right, is, is, is provide feedback back to the Army when they'll allow it. Uh, and, and do so in a constructive manner. I mean, you saw the article I did with uh, Davis Winkie in Army Times that was yep. published in January. Now, I'm not at war with the Army, but I, I really do want the Army to learn from from the experience they had with me. Right? Is that a way to say it? The experience they had well, with me. I want it's them to learn from that, right? It's, it's interesting you bring that up because I was just fortunate enough, uh, Lieutenant General John Jensen, the director of the Army National Guard. Great American. Um, was uh, was was came down here to Georgia and did a town hall with the, with the senior leaders of the, of the Georgia Guard and I, I sat in on it and um, you know they did an open forum and I was the one who got up and asked the question about social media not not even thinking you know you and I were going to have this conversation it wasn't really in the back of my mind but it was just and, one of those things and John and I were in Capstone together yeah well and he had and he that's you you were the first name that he brought up and I. <laughs> I uh, I thought as soon as he said I said I got to bring this up to uh, to General Donahoe when I talked to him. Um, but my question was simply is, you know, was what is the Army and, and the National Guard in particular, especially with civilians being in the Guard, doing about the battle that they have with social media? And, and do they have the appetite to try and put some regulations in to give soldiers right and left limits on what to do more confined with what they are? And he gave a very vague answer. I wasn't expecting one. And what I really wish I had, the question I had asked in retrospect, but I'll ask it to you was why is the Army so reluctant to meet this issue of social media 
head on. I can't tell you when I can scroll through social media, you have active duty people who have 110,000 followers and over here and over there on Instagram, whatever. Like there is a presence that these people have living online, not just guardsmen and reservists, but active duty folks. And we've never bothered to address the issue of, you know, it's, we don't see these people as, as people who can actually help us. We see them as threats. Right. And that's a problem. Like, you know, I work in media, right? And I have, the, I have a microphone in front of me and I'm on TV and I have all this stuff every day. I am the easiest poster boy for the National Guard of anybody out there. And yet never once in the 20 years plus years of my career has anybody ever said to me, hey, would you help us out with the Guard? Would you help us recruit? Would you help us promote? <laughs> never once has anybody ever said that. However, they have said to me, don't say this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's always... You know, I'm a threat before I could ever be something that could be a force multiplier, which is crazy to me. Right. I mean, again, we're a risk averse organization in many yeah. ways, right? Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest with you, you know, I'm a 55 year old man, right? I mean, we don't, my generation doesn't understand this technology, right? We don't understand what's, what's occurring in the communication evolution. It's not a revolution, it's evolution that we're living through. Mm-hmm. And so then we talk, you know, I mean, the senior leaders of the army are five years older than I am, right, or, or more. And they really don't understand how these things work. I mean, some of the, some of the stuff in my investigation was a lieutenant colonel who doesn't understand how these things work, right? And so he was equating a, an, an interaction I had on Twitter, which is purely public, right? It's like screaming on the side of the street, right? Uh, to be in like in a closed friend group with somebody. Like, it's not how this works, right? And... Um, and so, but a full misunderstanding of the technology. And I, I, had, I had a very senior leader in the army as I was going through a series of discussions about what I was, what I was dealing with, you know, tell me, well, hey, I really don't like, you know, social media because it, it, it uh, violates the chain of command and, you know, it allows, it allows soldiers to go around the chain of command. I said, well, sir, yeah, they, you know, I, I guess that's true, right? I said, but you know, when I was a battalion commander, and this is going back to you know 2005 and six. I had a soldier email the division commander. So email was the conduit of that, you know, abuse of the chain of command. By the way, though, the soldier didn't get in trouble. You know, I got an email from the division commander to go fix it. Right? Hey, what the hell is this about? Go fix it. Oh, okay. Right. It's the same thing as seeing something on Instagram or Twitter and saying, hey, what the fuck's going on down in, you know, X platoon, go fix it, right? It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a communication medium. I'd say it's probably the Pony Express guy showing up, you know, a letter for, you know, out in F troop on the, on the high plains, right? I mean, it's, it's what you do with the information that, that's important, right? It's about what commanders do with the information they get. It's not, it's not how the information gets to them, right? And so, and, and if you're willing to have, candid discussions with folks that are outside your chain of command. What's wrong with that? I think these are, I think it helps humanize senior leaders in the army. I think it helps, it helps, it helps soldiers understand what senior leaders are thinking about. I think it helps senior leaders understand what soldiers are thinking about. I think there's a lot of goodness to it. There's, there's a lot of badness too, right? And so when you get these, when you get these self-proclaimed active duty soldiers or national guardsmen who then are running a you know, an account that, it, you know, that's hiding behind a thin veneer of anonymity and they want to take pot shots at, you know, at the army. They want to, they want to, you know, make racist rants against the secretary of defense. They, they want to, you know, make, you know, libelous slander against, uh, you know, leaders that they're in their chain of command. Well, we got to figure out in the army how we're going to deal with that. Right. Because if it's a self-declared soldier who's, you know, you know, I am the, you know, Fort Benning, whatever. Okay, how do we deal with that if it's you know if they're violating the Uniform Code of Military Justice every day? Unfortunately, the simple answer is is you know e- either contract out an IT department uh, to track down where these tweets are coming from, the email account they're attached to, and everything else. And because every, every digital footprint is out there, there right. there's no way around it, right? You can make as many burner accounts as you want, but there's a way for it to lead back to you, yeah. IP addresses and everything. Like it's it's not hard. We we can do it. We just don't invest the time and energy into doing it. And, and the, the idea is very simply, again, let soldiers be themselves, right. okay? Let them be themselves in their own light and let, make them understand what the left and right limits are other than don't say anything bad about the military. That's vague. That doesn't mean anything. 
Well, like, can, if I would like you, to openly tell you, the world I had a shitty should, day at the you office. You should be able to say bad things about the military. Sure. As long as you're respectfully your chain of command, respectfully institution, you say, hey, look, I'm living in a I'm living in a building that's got you know mold growing off the walls. And hey, I, I've talked to my chain of command about it, and nothing's been done because we don't have all the money that we need to maintain all there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's that's like any soldier going to the press about it. Right? Can't prevent that. Soldier going to the congressman, right? And by the way, we should be willing to have those discussions. hundred percent. Whether whether that's I, I, whether that's we're a, so on afraid the to talk or that's that's on that's online. We should be willing to have those discussions. Uh um, yeah. I, I, it's a, it's a fixable problem. It's yeah. just they don't acknowledge it as one that needs to be fixed, and they, they just think it's going to go away at some point. And they don't acknowledge that we need to update policies and regulations of how we deal with the anonymous, self-declared you know soldiers that are out there who are who are attacking you know the institution in a in a you know pseudo I mean, you know violent way, right? Violating. The here's the first thing I would say: if if you can't say it openly yourself, then you truly don't believe it. So I would implore you to say, you, know, you don't need a burner account. If you have something bad to say about the military social media, say it. And then you know what? Walk into your chain of command's office and say it again. So now they can deal with it directly with you right. instead of random people on, on social media. But again, we're afraid to have conversations. Um, you know, we have to be able to do two things at once, right? We, that's, that's the entire core of the, We have to be able to do multiple things at once. But some, for somehow, you have to be able to handle soldiers whining, bitching, complaining, whatever it is about whatever, and still be able to train a force that is lethal enough to go kill the enemy. We, like, I, we've, been doing, I, we've been doing it since Valley Forge. It, it, guess right. what? It's not new. Right. But we're treating it like it's a new problem that we, we haven't figured out. And again, you know, I mean, we could go on all day about this. I, don't, I, yeah. I think we've made the point clear. I'll ask one more question reference to all this. Um, and it's simply, you know, the, the old meme, you should have thought before you, 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 <laughs> you hit the button tweet. Would, would, if you could just go back and not tweet that one thing to Tucker Carlson no. and avoid a headache and walk away. No, you're fine with it? I'm, I'm, good, I'm good with that interaction, right? Got a guy out there demeaning the service of, you know, a large number of brave Americans who volunteered to serve their country. And, and this guy is taking just absolute low ball shots at him. Everybody, everybody in the army should, should have got on media and said, that's stupid. And we don't, we don't subscribe to it. Um, it shouldn't take courage in 2023 to defend the service of women in the army. Right. That's, that's garbage. We should have all done it. Every, every single one of us. Um, now the thing that, you know, again, I, if, if I could take, I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have shot back at that jackass. Uh, Come get your boy. <laughs> on that Saturday, on that Saturday morning. <laughs> not my, not my best work. Shouldn't have I got to tell you though. I, I got to tell you though, the come get your boy lingo is, is, is very young. So you yeah, actually were right in the right wheelhouse. Who's hip. <laughs> I got teenagers. I don't, you know, I listen to it. At the dinner <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. Um, so, you're officially out of the army now. You're retired. You're just uh, respectfully, sir, Pat Dunham, right? yep. uh, retired major so general. It's maybe my mother gave me. I know, I know. Um, good old Irish Catholic, yeah. right? Uh, how? What else would you be other than Patrick? That's uh, right. Th that said, what do you what, what are you doing now? I know you said you're trying to help the military, but like, what? what where do you want to go now? What do you want to accomplish so, now? So I'm actually, I'm. Um, uh, you know, if you go to my Twitter feed, my first, my first, my pin tweet talks about lifelong learning, and that's been my pin tweet for an awful long time. Right, the value of intellectual development over time. And so I'm working for Columbus State University and Columbus Technical College here in the city of Columbus, Georgia, as a uh, special assistant uh, to the presidents of those two institutions over, you know, kind of how, how to provide better opportunities to military affiliated students, how to expand opportunities for, you know, soldiers, veterans, and family members to, to further their education and their and, and, you know, on the Columbus Tech side to get credentials that make them mm -hmm. employable no matter where they go in their, you know, in their soldier's career, right? And so, um, you know, that, I, I, there's great meaning to that for me. The other thing I'm doing is I, you know, I established, like every other retired general, I've got my little LLC, my consulting company. And uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to do there is I'm, 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 I'm trying to do a couple of things. I'm trying to, trying to help companies that, that have really beneficial uh, products or services uh, that could help the army deal with problems it has, uh, trying to help them for, you know, kind of, kind of formulate uh, the, the way they explain those uh, processes, uh, procedures uh, that they've built 
and uh, in the, in the service that they provide and be able to explain that better to the Army so that the Army may uh, benefit from it, right? Um, and then, and then the, the other thing I'm, I'm doing is I'm doing a bunch of keynote speaking. Like, I'm going to go up to Cornell University tomorrow. Uh, now, they're not paying anything for me to do that. They're paying my travel. Uh, so I'll, I'll lose money doing that. Matter of fact, I've got to pay, I got to do an unpaid, uh, I got to do an unpaid day of, uh, of leave for that, uh, to go do that from uh, the universities. But that's okay, because I, I want to remain connected um, to soldiers and, and, and the military. Uh, but also, I want to, you know, if I can, if I can move that down the road into where, you know, I get, I get paid to speak, obviously, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an Irish Catholic kid. I, I, I talk a lot. If I can pay by the word, it's going to be even better. And then I'm doing, uh, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing battlefield guided experiences. And so I'm taking a group of seven in Jan and June, and we're going to go to Normandy and Bastogne. And oh, as, wow. And so that'll be, that'll be great. I've got a battlefield guide that I've hired, but I've also, I've rented a chateau right off of the D1 exit from Omaha beach. That was, uh, the headquarters of the 116th Infantry Regiment uh, in early in early June 1944. Sounds awesome. <laughs> and I've and I've rented a chateau on the outskirts of Bastogne, which was the 101st Airborne's headquarters in uh, January 45. And then we're gonna we're, you know we're gonna I mean, I, it's funny I mean just getting ready for this one trip. I mean I've been studying like I'm gonna get a a quiz that my life depends on on. Uh, Omaha, Utah, the airborne landings. And See, then, now that's a staff ride I'm in for. I've done no. Gettysburg way too many times. I, you know, we, 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 I don't need Gettysburg. I want Bastogne. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Well, but you know, I'll tell you, I mean, it, the Bastogne fight is incredible. Like, the Battle, Battle of the Bulge fight is incredible. And um, you go, we, we, there's this narrative that it's, you know, the, the American army collapses and the 101st gets in to seize Bastogne and then Patton liberates it. But everybody else was a coward. And it's it's crazy. The most decorated platoon in the Second World War from the Army is the INR platoon, the Intelligence and Reconnaissance Platoon of the 394th Regiment of the 99th Infantry Division that fights for a full day. 21 guys on a hilltop hold back a, an airborne regiment of the German Army. It's incredible. I mean, and, and it's, it, it is hundreds of those stories of soldiers out of the 99th, the 4th, the 2nd, the 106th, uh, who, who sacrifice everything to delay the German advance, to give the time required for Patton to turn and to get the, you know, get the 101st to best out. It's, it's a fascinating story. And it's, uh, and the, the current narrative in American thought doesn't doesn't give the the honor to the to those soldiers that fought from December 16th you know all the way through to the the closure of the siege around Bastogne I mean and the sacrifice is incredible incredible to say the least well look uh continued success and luck with that I would love a full report on how it goes and uh <laughs> you know if I can't make the one to Bastogne I'll certainly love to hop on the next one uh but it, it's a uh, I think that's great. I mean, looks and the education never stops, right? Yep. You know, the, the the learning never stops, and and um, if anything, that you know, the army has a whole center for uh, lessons learned, you know, uh, on on everything, and hopefully, you know, the the growing of the individuals never stops as well. But I, look, I, I appreciate so much of of your time and what you've had to spend. It's one of our longer episodes, but I think it's it's been fantastic, just because I, more than anything, I don't want you to be defined by the last 12 to 14 months, including the investigation time of your career, yeah. because there's so much more there. Like, and I, and I think it's unfair. And I, I, I hope people take away from this, that there was a lot more to what, you know, a 33 year career was other than the, the last 13, 14 months of it. Right. Like the first 32 were equally as powerful and important. Um, and, and, and I, I think that story absolutely needs to be told. And we barely even scratch the surface of it. I'm sure there's plenty more that we didn't even, we didn't even get to, but I just, I genuinely wanted to say thank you. And, um, I appreciate you because full disclosure, folks, I reached out to General Donahoe on social media and asked him for an interview. Right. And you were gracious enough to respond <laughs> and get back. And, uh, you know, at least you're still active on social media and everybody knows where they can find you now. That's right. Um, yeah. but you know, um, I, I thank you so much for just for your time, sharing your stories, uh, and, and your spirit and your heart with everybody. I, I think it's, you know, uh, you, you and I would get along quite well on the outside. Good. I'd like it. <laughs> awesome. Well, sir, again, continued success. Uh, certainly appreciate it. Uh, people know where to find you, but 
as always. Thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.